This is June 27, 2023. This is physics 39. And we are looking at the, right now we're gonna look at the Microsoft interferometer. Okay, Microsoft interferometer. Wikipedia. Okay, and Michael's also right in here. You go, here's a model of a Michael's interferometer. It's a very simple device. It's made of three mirrors, one fixed mirror, one movable mirror, and this is here is a it's half of a mirror. It's like it's called a beam splitter. It doesn't reflect the light 100%. It reflects the light only 50% and it's partially transparent. That's how it looks like. Uh, and uh, the common Michael's interferometer is a common configuration for optical interferometry and was invented in the 19th to, through the 20th century by Albert Michelson, American physicist, using a beam splitter. The beam splitter is this one right here. Light source, well, I, I don't show the light source. Notice that there are some knobs here on the back, right? A light source is splitting two arms and each of the light beams is reflected back towards the beam splitter which then combine their amplitude using superposition principle. Okay, oh, and the Michelson interferometer is employed in many scientific experiments and became well known for its use by Michelson and Edward Morley. The story is very fascinating. The story of the Michelson-Morley experiment was in 1887. Okay, and the uh, the idea there at that time was to, to find out the, to prove the, not, not to prove, but to find out the relative motion of the earth with respect to the luminiferous ether. We're going to elaborate a little bit more when we start on, on this experiment, when we start the relativity theory. Okay, but this, the configuration of the, Michelson interferometer is like that. Okay, so here you go. So we have this bench. We have uh, several Michelson interferometers there at LA Harbor. And in every physics 39 course, I go through this, through this apparatus, right? With my students, we make measurements with the interfer on this with this interferometer. And no, oh, there's a bench here. You know, it's a device more or less the size. You can have larger interferometers, but the one for, for the classroom is a smaller one. And here you go. Partially reflecting mirrors, a beam splitter. And you saw the drawing, the picture, right? And then we put a fixed mirror, right? Three mirrors, right? One, two, and a movable mirror. A movable mirror. This mirror can move uh, like one micron distance, has a resolution of one micron distance. This mirror is attached to a micrometer that has this one micron resolution. You're going to see the, the, the video that we have to. Okay, but let's start with this drawing, right? Very simple, right? Only three devices plus the micrometer. We have a laser source, a monochromatic, monochromatic source, can be 633 nanometers, can be different, okay? And how does it work? Light goes towards the beam splitter, is a partially reflecting mirror. Those things are sold out there. You can buy those partially reflecting mirrors. Some of the light is reflected and part the remaining of the light is transmitted. 
Now you have two beams, one beam propagating in this direction, the other beam pro propagating in this other direction at an angle of 90 degrees. Don't forget that the laser source here. And the light is reflected from the movable mirror. By the way, it's not that displaced. Ideally, I should be drawing like that and very close to it, but since we don't have the space, right? I put it a little bit uh, to the other side. And then this one is also going to reflect. Okay, don't forget that there's a changing phase under this reflection, there's a changing phase under this reflection. This guy so far doesn't have any changing phase, but he's gonna have a changing phase once he reflects back. So here you go, the blue light beam now has a change in phase. This one has two changes in phase because it has reflected from here and has reflected from here. This one so far has just one phase change. And then in the next move, in the next uh, reflection, okay, this guy gets uh, the same phase difference as this one get, right? And now those two beams are combined. It's possible to, to have this beam trans. There's something else going through and something else also reflected from here, but we don't want to observe the fringe pattern here because the laser is in the way, right? So it's more convenient to observe the interference pattern on this side. Okay, and then we project it into a screen can be projected to a screen, or if the light source is too weak, we observe it through a telescope. Either way, it works, okay? So if I move this mirror, that there will be a, I can control a face, the displays, I can control the path length difference between those two light beams, right? And what I'm going to do, yeah, I'm gonna use this one instead. The next one, right? I am emphasizing that the pass length here is the same as the pass length here, okay? And because it's reflecting to itself, it's more, would be more realistic if I had overlapped those two arrows here, but I don't overlap them because otherwise you won't be able to see it. Yeah, and then I'm gonna do that for the same blue ray here. Okay. So here you go, here's this one that's reflected, this one here that's transmitted. And they have almost the same path lengths. So the theory goes like that. Here you go, this, uh, the path length difference, this, from, from this being splitter to this spot is gonna be the same distance. What is gonna be varying is this distance here, this minus this, okay? Pass length of one minus two, and the theory goes according to the following. The path length difference between the two light rays, right? Yes, two light rays is D1 uh, minus D2. And I can even label that, not this one.
that would be D1. D1. And the other one here would be D2. I'm going to put it in the same color as the light rays are, so you can associate the path lengths with the light ray. Red. OK. And, oh, by the way, it's true D1, right? It's not D1, but it's true D1 because you have one way and the back, right? One way and the back. So going back here, let's, let's fix that. It's equal to path length difference. So let's put it this way. Path length difference. And I'll call that a delta D. Delta D. Okay, for constructive interference, now you should know, right? For constructive uh, interference, we have in relation that should be a integer number of the wavelengths m equal to m equal to zero one two three Bah, bah, bah. can also be negative as well. My plus and minus. Plus and minus. So on. For destructive interference. For destructive interference, one, two, three. We have the following relation. A half of a wavelength, right? Equal to what? Lambda over two, you know, three. Three lambda over two. Five, half of a wavelength. Five lambda over two. Etc. And then a, oh, one, two, three. And then the genetic equation would be what? Two m, two m plus one over two. Lambda. Just like before. And let's see how it looks like. Ideally, we should be performing experiments with an actual, actual interferometer, OK? A micro interferometer. But like I said, it's a very, it's a historically you know, important device because, OK, let's write it down. It is a historically important device, important device because it provided evidence that the luminiferous ether, luminiferous ether, ether right here, 
did not exist. Did not exist. So it, uh, Michael saw himself when he was pro, pro uh, when he was performing those experiments. He didn't believe his results. He thought there was something wrong with his interferometer. This is a highly sensitive. This is a highly sensitive device that is used to measure displacements, distance, okay? Let's take a look at the microphone. Okay, here, here's the description of the instrument, right? What I want to do, let's take a look at the biography of Mike, uh, Albert Michelson. Go. Was a Prussian born Polish American physicist of Jewish descent. Okay. Known for his work for measuring the speed of the, of the light. Yeah, he measured the speed of the light. And uh, he also could uh, measure the speed of the Earth in space. That's what he thought. He thought that he could. Uh, perform an experiment to determine the speed of the Earth with respect to the luminiferous ether. If the Earth was moving in a given direction with respect to the luminiferous ether, he would get a given result. If the Earth was, was moving with respect to another, you know, with respect to luminiferous ether in another direction, he would expect to get a different result. And he never got a different result. He always got the same result. And he saw that there was something wrong with his device. Okay, so he won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1907 for that. And speed of light, uh, early measurements. Okay, in as early 1869, uh, start planning to repeat the rotating by Leon de Foucault. Okay, so Michelson managed to build his his uh, interferometer because of this guy, by the way. Okay, because of this guy, Foucault himself. So he was inspired by the work of Foucault. He, Foucault also had interferometers, had built his own interferometer. And uh, Einstein himself made the reference to an experiment that Foucault performed in the past. And uh, Einstein didn't know about Mike Michelson experiments, okay? But he knew about, about the experiments performed by Foucault. And uh, it was the, one of the experiments performed by Foucault that uh, Einstein provided as evidence of his special relativity theory that nobody would believe at the, at the time. And... Mount Wilson, okay. Uh, Michelson worked at the Mount Wilson Observatory, which is nearby Pasadena. I've been there several times. They have a museum there with uh, yeah, Michelson's interferometer. Simon Newcomb is more adequate for obtaining a value. Okay, yeah, he used the Michelson interferometer as well. He found his method in 1883, published the measurement of the light. I say, uh, Michelson's formal experiment took place in June, July 1879. Okay. So, Naval Academy, right? Published his result of the speed of the light, 299,000 kilometers per second, 299,910. So, so after he started in 1878, right? Maybe even 1869. One more student. So in 1879 that he published his results and his experiments also in 1879, the, it, it took time for him to refine his device, right? So let's, let's put here, it was invented by Mike Somorley around 1879. An invention like that takes time to be invented, right? So you can see from his, from his biography that, uh, he started planning in 1869, but he was using the rotating mirror method of Leon Foucault. 
Okay, he conducts some preliminary using largely improvised equipment in 1878. Okay. And formal experiments took place in 1879. A frame building along the North Sea Wall of the Naval Academy. Okay, he built, apparently he built a very large uh, interferometer. Uh, Along the North Sea Wall of the Naval Academy. Okay, Mike soon published his results, 1879. And, uh, and Simon Newcomb repeated Michael Sol's experiment in, in 1906. Let's see, to obtain the speed of the light. Okay, though this result has been subsequently, oh, 1920, Mike Sol started planning a definitive measurement for the speed of the light from Mount Wilson Observatory. You can go there. A really interesting place there. And uh, let, let's take a look at the luminiferous ether, what they say about the luminiferous ether here. Uh, okay. In 1887, he, he and Edward Morley carry, carried out the famous Michael Morley experiment, which failed to detect evidence of the existence of luminif luminiferous ether. He thought that uh, his experiment was a failure. But uh, was the but in hindsight we know today that was the most successful failure in, in human history. Okay, and later he moved to on to use astronomical interferometers in the measurement of the stellar diameters. That's how sensitive his 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 interferometer was. Okay, okay. and because of that he won the Nobel Prize in physics. And we we study his his equipment today. Okay, so keep that in mind. Let's look at again how it, how it works. Michael's interferometer, a mirror, a, well, a partially reflecting mirror. We call it a beam splitter. It's a beam splitter because it split one beam into two, right? A fixed mirror, almost a hundred percent reflecting mirror, and a movable mirror. Just review it again, a light source, monochromatic light source. Light comes from the laser. It's reflected by the beam splitter. Some of the light passes through. We're just repeating it again. So you can have a, a memorize how this device works. Both lights are reflected by their respective mirror. The pass length of this first light is going to be two times d one, right? The pass length of the other light beam is going to be two times d two. That's where the difference in pass length comes from, from this round trip travel, because those light beams are then combined on the lower side of the of the being splitter, right? I'm going to, one is reflected, the other is transmitted. The red beam is transmitted, the, the blue beam is reflected. And that's where you put your screen to see an interference pattern, okay? Here's the inside of the micro, uh, the micro interferometer that we have in there. It's a micrometer. This micrometer can move very short distance. Remember that the regular micrometer that we have has a resolution of 20 microns, 10, not 20, 10 microns. But this one can go all the way down to one micron using a lever mechanism, a very smart lever mechanism, okay? So if you have a point of rotation here and then uh, a lever and apply the tip of the micrometer to this lever, by the way, notice that the distance from the point of rotation here is smaller than the distance here. So if you, if you move, let's say, a given distance right here, because you have a lever, uh, actually you have an inverted lever, right? You have an inverted lever because you have less force. So if you move a given uh, given distance here, here you're going to move less. Okay, and that's the, how the movable mirror moves back and forth. Okay, and let's take a look at the 
as an actual Michelson interferometer in this video here from MIT. Okay, so take a look at the devices in there. We have one, two, three mirrors and the micrometer that I, I mentioned. Okay. And the base, right? Oh, the laser right in here. Laser source right in here. That's the beam splitter the partially reflecting mirror, the adjustable. Uh, okay, uh, this this is the fixed mirror, okay? This is the fixed mirror. Why, why did it say adjustable? You shouldn't have the said adjustable. Well, it's adjustable. Every mirror here is adjustable. This one is, and this one are adjustable. What you are, what you are adjusting is just the pitch angle, okay? And the, and the horizontal, angle of the mirror. That's what he means by adjustable. And this one is the movable mirror. Here's the micrometer, micrometer knob. Okay, using an interferometer to measure wavelengths. Okay, that's how the interference pattern of the Michaels interferometer looks like. So light goes, light is reflect, is split here at the at the B splitter. Some of the light goes towards this direction. Other the other part of the light is transmitted towards the second mirror, the movable mirror. In order to perform this experiment, you have to adjust the mirrors. You have to there, there are some details. Okay, you have to align the mirrors themselves so you can get this interference pattern. This interference pattern is not straightforward, okay? There's some adjustment that you have to make. And the light is reflected. Light here is reflected. Okay, this light beam is reflected toward the screen. This other light beam is transmitted through the beam splitter and they combine they, they combine in an interference pattern that you see right in here. Okay, and now he's going to adjust the micrometer. He's going to move this mirror that you see right in here and take a look what happens to this pattern, right? Okay, the, the fringes, they start to move. In this experiment, what we do, we keep on counting the fringes with respect to a given point, okay? Now he's returning. Each time the pattern returns to identical position, the mirror has moved half of a wavelength, okay? Three, squad, cinco. Okay, let, let's count the fringes. Let's count the fringes together. Uh, count the fringes with respect to the center of this pattern, okay? So move it back here. That's the type of experiment that we do. And that's the type of thing that uh, first time I was exposed to this type of interferometer was, that, was back there uh, in Albuquerque. Okay, they have a, a Air Force laboratory there that's called Phys Phillips Research Site one of the US Air Force laboratories, and then they asked me to perform experiments with uh, interferometer, but it was optical fiber interferometer, which was not the Michael Somorley configuration, it was another one that we call Max Zander, but it provides a, you know fringes just like you, you have here. You go, now I'm gonna move, watch it. Let's see, one, two, three, four, Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. <laughs> eleven. Okay. Now he's going back, right? Each path, each time the pattern returns to identical position, the mirror has moved half of a wavelength. Okay, and different fingerprints are marked so that cycles may be counted more easily. He's putting a tape here, 
right? In the dark, he put that in the yeah, he's put this, he's putting this one in the dark fringe, right? This one is put in the bright one, the bright spot. Constructive destructive interference, right? Constructive destructive interference. And now we'll be able to count when the micrometer knob is moved half of wavelengths. The fringes will complete one cycle and a new fringe will appear between the tape. Okay, let's take it. Gonna move. Here go. Okay. One cycle. Here you go. Right? One, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, and twenty. We performed this experiment to find the wavelengths of this light that you see right here. Okay. And we have the micrometer that's already calibrated. See, the micrometer is already calibrated. And uh, if you, I do not know if you have already been exposed to a regular micrometer, but this micrometer here has a resolution of half of a micron. And the distance that it traveled was 6.5 microns. Okay, 6.5 microns. That's the distance that it traveled. So this mic micrometer is like a regular micrometer with that additional lever that I showed to you in the, in the drawing, right? In the slide. And now he's going to perform here the calculations to find out. He go, here's the pass length difference, right? That's the pass length difference. 2D divided by the number of fringes. 6.5 microns. And we counted 20 fringes. And we can get the wavelengths as being 650 nanometers or 0.65 micrometers. OK. Let's take a look at the theory, which is similar to what I did for you. Here you go, here's the setup. Here's the light coming from the laser. It is split into paths, the blue ray and the red ray. Note that the phase of the light was inverted, right? Here as well. The phase of the light was inverted as well as here. This one reflection, the phase gets inverted. And then this blue light is going to get its phase inverted as well. Yeah, right in here. And now they're combining with each other. He drew that as a wave. I drew the, my own light as a straight line, right? As an arrow. Depending on the position of this movable mirror, you can you can have a constructive and destructive interference. Right? This one is constructive interference. Very close to constructive interference, the resulting. Why is one quarter of a wavelength if a destructive interference is one half of a wavelength, right? There's a reason. Right? The reason because of the round trip of the light, right? The light travels a quarter of wavelengths and another quarter of wavelengths, which ends up being half of a wavelength. Go. Reflection of the red beam, reflection of the blue and red beam. Okay, now they are undergoing destructive interference.
Okay, so the mirror moved further, right? Here he moved half of uh, one, one quarter of a wavelength, another quarter of a wavelength. And so you have constructive interference again. Okay, and now here you go. Okay, let's pause a little bit, right? In this position, you have constructive interference. In this position, you move a quarter of a wavelength to result in destructive interference. Again, it's a quarter of interference because it's, it's a round trip that counts, right? The round trip ends up being half of a wavelength, which results in the destructive interference. And then if the mo mirror moves another quarter of wavelength to this spot, right? The mirror was originally here, then here, and then it's placed here. Now we have a round trip difference equal to a whole, a full wavelength. And we have constructive interference. Okay, so that's what you have to know about the Michelson Morley device. And we're going to work with uh, with some actual data that I collected in the classroom. It's going to be one of our labs during the semester, OK? Also, don't forget that we have a lab two today. Let me, this one that I want, OK? And note see that this device is much simpler to understand than compared, right? The thin film theory, right? Thin film theory. This, the, the theory of the thin film. In the case of the theory of the thin film, right? In the case uh, of the thin film, we must worry about the refractive index of the thin film. In this case, in this case of the Maxon, of the Maxon experiment. Come on. Because of the Microsoft experiment, there is no refractive index to worry about. Okay. Save it here. Any questions? What is the inter what is the inter theory and how was it disproved in this experiment? Yeah, there is a very nice video that uh, explains this, this uh, the thing. Well, what happened is that at the time uh, after Newton, right? People always thought that there was this absolute referential, a referential that would not move, okay? And this absolute referential, the uh, referential that was at rest, right? The absolute uh, re reference that, that you can measure motion from any type of motion with respect to it, they call it the ether, the luminiferous ether, okay? And there is a very nice uh, video that explains that, uh, unfortunately, this video is not a very good, uh, you know, they have, a, let, me, let me see if I can find it here, um, mechanical universe, okay? They have very nice graphics explaining the, the luminiferous ether and its absolute referential. It's mechanical universe, uh, Michelson. The only thing, you, get, you know, oh, here you go. That's the one. Here you go. See the pattern here? Mm, uh, Michelson Morley experiment. Let, let's watch this video. I like this video. The only problem of this video is that uh, they uploaded a very low quality of this 
of this episode, okay? Uh, I used to watch there with my students at Santa Monica College. We had the, the original video that uh, had a very good quality, but let's watch it. It's going to be half an hour, okay? It's worth it. But again, you know, sorry if the quality is not as good as I wish it is, it were. So physicists thought that there was this special type of referential that should uh, that was at rest, it was at absolute rest, and that they called the luminiferous ether, and they they got this idea stuck in their heads. When in reality, this absolute referential didn't exist at all. It was, uh, it took someone called Albert Einstein to convince, not, not just Albert Einstein, but the experiments of Michael Morley too, to convince the scientific community that there was no such a thing as an absolute referential. Okay? The only thing that existed was relative referentials. That's what existed. And that's why the theory of Einstein is called the uh, theory of relativity, right? Because it, it deals with relative referentials. The Caltech setting, Mike Saul Morley experiment. I'd like to tell you today about what is perhaps the most famous experiment in all the history of physics. It's called the Michelson-Morley experiment, and it was designed to detect the motion of the Earth through the luminiferous ether. The ether was an invention of 19th century physicists to explain how light could be transmitted through empty space between the sun and the Earth. Physics has its folklore and its legends, just like any other culture. For example, I'm sure you remember the famous story of Isaac Newton and the apple. Well, there's a legend about the Michelson Morley experiment that's just as deeply rooted as the story about Isaac and the apple. It goes like this Michelson and Morley did their experiment and proved that there was no ether. And so Albert Einstein was forced to invent the theory of relativity in order to explain that result. The experiment was done at what was then called the Case Institute of Technology in Cleveland, Ohio in 1887. For that experiment to have been done in Cleveland in 1887 was something like the first real theory of electricity coming out of Philadelphia more than a century before. In the 1880s, Cleveland and the United States was still the scientific wilderness and especially Cleveland, Ohio. <laughs> In fact, it's just possible that the Michelson Morley experiment was the most important thing that did happen in Cleveland until Satchel Page pitched for the Indians. <laughs> but the most remarkable thing about this whole tale may be the fact that Albert Michelson, for the remaining 50 years of his life, considered his great experiment to have been a failure. Today, We'll see if we can understand why that happened. 1887, the time of Victoria, Queen of England and Empress of India. London is the world capital of commerce. Across the channel in Germany, a child named Albert Einstein celebrates his eighth birthday. 
It's been 23 years since James Clark Maxwell stated his equations for electromagnetic radiation. Beyond the Atlantic, the Americans have enjoyed more than two decades of peace and prosperity since their terrible civil war drew to a close. Waves of migrants from Europe are swelling the population of the United States. The Western frontier is being settled and settling down. Looking back, 1887 seems like a time of tranquility, not only in commerce and politics, but also in science. Many physicists believed that all the great discoveries had been made. Physics had reached a state of perfection that was positively ethereal. In fact, the concept of the ether was one of its central tenets. And in 1887, in Cleveland, Ohio, two physicists, Albert Abraham Michelson and Edward W. Morley, were preparing an experiment designed to prove once and for all that the ether really existed. Certainly, the ether really had existed, at least in the minds of philosophers, for thousands of years. Today, we can readily accept the idea of space as a vacuum, vast stretches of the cosmos that are virtually devoid of matter. But to the ancients, the concept of a perfect void was impossible to grasp. Space had to be filled with something, they thought, and the solution that Aristotle devised was the ether. That was the substance that filled what would otherwise be empty space. And by the 19th century, the ether had come to serve more than a merely philosophical need. The ether was the medium through which light waves from the sun would propagate to nourish and illuminate the earth. Waves can propagate along the surface of water, or through the body of a crystal, or through the air of a concert hall. But any wave is a disturbance that passes through a medium from one part to another on down the line. In other words, whenever there's a wave, something must be waving. But when light waves from the sun reach the earth through apparently empty space, what's waving? In the 19th century, the answer was as clear as space itself. It was the ether. To 19th century physicists, the ether was not only real, it had physical properties that could be deduced by observing its behavior. For example, the speed of any wave depends on the stiffness of the medium through which it passes. And of course, the speed of light is enormous. So, the ether must be very stiff indeed. In fact, physicists said, it was nearly impossible to compress it at all. On the other hand, the Earth and other planets moved through the incompressible ether with perfect ease, obeying Newton's laws as if they weren't passing through any medium at all. If the ether behaved like a viscous fluid, the orbiting planets would gradually lose energy and spiral inward towards the sun. And since that certainly didn't seem to be happening, physicists were able to reach another definite conclusion about the ether. The ether, they said, was a perfectly mobile fluid with no viscosity at all. It was a transparent, perfectly non-viscous, incompressible fluid that filled all of space. Knowing so much about it, the only job that remained was to demonstrate its existence directly in a clear and irrefutable experiment. Somehow, that job had eluded the grasp of physicists throughout the century. But in 1887, Albert Michelson, with the help of his friend Edward Morley, had devised an experiment that couldn't fail. As far as academic credentials go, Michelson was unquestionably qualified. Four years at Annapolis, eight at the Case School of Applied Science in Cleveland, 
and three more years at Clark University in Worcester, Massachusetts. But it would take more than teaching excellence to detect the absolute motion of the Earth through space, which in effect would detect the ether itself. It would take an extraordinary experiment with an unheard of degree of accuracy. Fortunately, Michelson had an established talent for designing instruments that could make the tiniest and most precise measurements. His earlier measurements of the speed of light were better than any others before him. When he was in Berlin, Michelson designed a new instrument that was exquisitely precise. It was called an interferometer. Shown here using a laser, a Michelson interferometer begins by splitting a beam of light into two beams. A partially transparent and partially reflecting. Now watch out this referential, okay? It's a it's an X and Y axis. He's illustrating the luminiferous ether, the so-called luminiferous ether that was nothing but uh, an uh, arbitrary creation of the human mind to satisfy to satisfy a need for a physical medium through which light was supposed to propagate. That's why they created the ether. They thought that light, in order to be a wave, in order to propagate as a wave, it required a medium. But the vacuum of space is no medium at all. There's no medium. There's almost nothing in there. So they had to create this luminiferous ether to believe that light was a wave. That was the whole, the whole thing. And by creating this incorrect, this erroneous idea of, uh, of the ether, this, the mind of the scientist became stuck into a paradigm that wouldn't allow them to advance in the knowledge. So this experiment of Michelson was in reality a paradigm shift that occurred back there at that back then at that time. Even Michelson himself wouldn't believe his results. So because of uh, mind, his mind was stuck in this idea of the luminiferous ether. It, it took someone else like Albert Einstein to free himself from the shackles, right, of the idea of the luminiferous ether. And that's why we study this experiment of Michelson, because it was indeed a paradigm shift at the time that it was performed. And now watch these coordinates here that you see, the X and Y axis, right? All those squares that you see here are the coordinates of the so-called luminiferous ether. Here's the photon coming towards this beam splitter. Mirror sends two beams traveling on perpendicular paths. Each is reflected back to the point where they had been split in two. There, they combine into a single beam again. Michelson's interferometer can be seen as a race between two light beams. If the race ends in a tie, the result is a bright spot at the center of the interference pattern. But in Michelson's time, they believed it shouldn't be a tie. Okay, now the that, luminiferous ether is moving. I do not know if you can see in there. The, the quality is not very good. Okay, it's not, it's not the luminiferous ether is moving. It's the interferometer that's moving with respect to the luminiferous ether. It shouldn't even be a horse race. There you go. That's because the two beams of light were racing on a moving track. Everyone suspected the Earth, and therefore the interferometer, were moving through the ether. And so the beam should trace out quite different paths with respect to the ether. The beam moving sideways to the Earth's motion makes a triangle, while the one moving along the motion has less distance to go one way, but more the other. On their round trips, the beam along the direction of motion has a little farther to go. So the sideways beam should always win. Michelson knew that the expected difference in the arrival of the two beams would be very small. 
After all, the speed of light is three times 10 to the eighth meters per second, while the speed of the earth through the ether is only three times 10 to the fourth meters per second. And to make matters very much worse, since the two beams had to go forward and back before being compared, the difference in the time they took would depend on the square of that ratio. It would be a difference of only one part in a hundred million. Ironically, that tiny difference in travel time would be the exact proof that Galileo desperately needed three centuries earlier. The absolute concrete proof he needed to show that Copernicus had been right and that the earth really moves around the sun. Perhaps Galileo could have won his case if he'd had real scientific proof that the earth moves. Although it's doubtful that he had Galileo in mind, that tiny difference in the travel time of the two beams of light was just what Michelson set out to measure in Berlin in 1880. A German instrument making firm built the first interferometer. And in 1881... Uh, th think about that. Uh, Michelson didn't build the interferometer himself. He just designed it. He put that in paper, how he wanted the interferometer to be built. He didn't have the skills to do that, okay? People who build that are, are not university professors. People who build that are technicians that work for private businesses, okay? So that's why what he's saying here. He hired a company a German company, right, to build this interferometer. Let, 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 let's, let's hear it again. And although it's doubtful that he had Galileo in mind, that tiny difference in the travel time of the two beams of light was just what Michelson set out to measure in Berlin in 1880. A German instrument making firm built the first interferometer. There you go. In 1881, when Michelson went to Potsdam, he took it with him. It was sensitive, all right. So sensitive that horse-drawn wagons, even pedestrians, on the street outside his lab affected his measurements. That's the problem of, of inventing something that's uh, very sensitive. You can get signals from places that you don't want it to get, and that becomes noise in your instrument. Okay? So... The instrument was so sensitive, but so sensitive that he was picking up people walking by far away from him. So he had to somehow filter out all this noise. And this guy is going to tell you what he did to filter out the noise in his experiment. Each time he tried, it took almost a day to get a single measurement. So when Michelson saw no ether effect in his measurements, he wasn't concerned. He thought correctly that his instrument wasn't dependable enough. Time passed and Michelson did no more with the interferometer. He returned to the United States and took a position with Case Institute in Cleveland. And during that period, he and Edward W. Morley, a physicist and chemist at Western Reserve University, became colleagues and close friends. Other physicists, meanwhile, urged him to try again to detect the ether. So, in 1887, Michelson asked his friend Morley... Okay, so from 1881 to 1887, that's what it took to, to improve the instrument, right? The instrument in 1881 was so sensitive that it was picking up too much noise and he couldn't do anything with his, with his instrument. Then he figured out how to do, how to eliminate all that noise, six years to do that. To work with him on a new and highly sensitive interferometer. The new interferometer was 10 times more sensitive than his 1880 instrument. Michelson had been thinking of ways to make the interferometer steady and not susceptible to passing carts and people. The mirrors rested on an enormous base of sandstone that floated in a pool of mercury. Okay, that's what he did. He put everything on the top uh, of a pool of mercury. The mercury was 
you know, stable enough to to eliminate all that noise that was coming from people outside. Today we wouldn't be able to do that, right? Mercury is kind of a banned uh, liquid. Liquid mercury is a banned uh, material, so much that we don't put uh, liquid mercury in thermometers anymore. When Michelson and Morley tested the new interferometer, they were thrilled and delighted. The instrument had all the stability and sensitivity they had hoped for and should be able easily to detect the tiny expected difference in travel time of the two beams of light due to motion through the ether. The actual experiment was to be done by observing the interference pattern with the interferometer in one orientation with respect to the motion through the ether. That's another orientation. If the two beams arrived in a tie, for example, constructive interference would make a bright spot at the center of the pattern. Another orientation. Just to change the relative if motion the of the light. If arrived slightly ahead of the other, destructive interference could make the center dark. In other words, the effect of motion through the ether would be seen in the shift of the interference fringes as the instrument was rotated. That's what Michael's expected to, to obtain. That was the experimental results that he expected to obtain. To the complete surprise of Michelson and Morley, and just about everyone else, there was no shift at all in the fringes, which means there was no delay, nothing, no difference at all. That was the actual experimental result. Okay, and they couldn't believe that they were getting this experimental results. No matter how they varied the experiment, summer or winter, night or day, the result was the same. Light apparently travels at the same speed in all directions, in complete disagreement with the idea of Earth moving through the ether. For the next 50 years, numerous physicists repeated the Michelson-Morley experiment with ever-increasing precision and sophistication in the vain hope of finding some mistake in that perplexing conclusion. But even in 1887, the facts were clear. The experiment had failed to detect the ether, and the consequences were shattering. The negative result was almost as disturbing for Michelson as it was for physics as a whole. He truly believed the ether existed, and that he and Morley had simply failed to detect it. Sustained by a legendary sense of humor, Michelson carried on through the years. And he continued to succeed as a virtuoso of experimental physics. Nonetheless, he remained haunted by the results, or the lack of them, in his experiment with Edward Morley. Putting the idea of the ether in historical perspective, it had been important beyond measure. In 1887, its existence was as important as, in the day of Copernicus, the location of the sun. No experiment had been better conceived nor more carefully executed. And in science, when such an experiment fails, it not only creates a theoretical dilemma, it can provoke fantastic responses in the scientific community. In 1892, the Irish physicist Gia Fitzgerald suggested that the size of one arm of the Michelson and Morley interferometer might have somehow contracted. How much it contracted, he said, depended on its velocity. To most physicists, Fitzgerald's contraction sounded absurd. But not to Europe's most distinguished physicist, H.A. Lorentz. 
He worked out a quantitative model to explain the phenomenon, and in the process, developed mathematical expressions that would change the face of physics. They came to be called the Lorentz transformations. In 1899, the great French mathematician Henri Poincaré examined the results obtained by Michelson and Morley. He offered a general explanation, calling it the principle of relativity. The idea behind it was that absolute motion will never be detected in the laboratory. There must arise an entirely new kind of dynamics, he said. Okay, the, the principle, principle of relativity was with Poincaré, okay? And Einstein must, must have known about uh, Poincaré's suggestions when he came up with his own theory. Poincaré was right. An entirely new kind of dynamics would arise. But the principle of relativity, which would be its cornerstone, was far from new. It went back at least as far as Galileo Galilei. Galileo had said that an object in motion would tend to remain in that same state of uniform motion. That was the law of inertia. It was correct because in its own frame of reference, every state of uniform motion was in reality, a state of rest. In other words, Galileo understood not only the law of inertia, but also the reason it was true. There is no difference at all between being at rest and being in uniform motion. But on the other hand, Albert Michelson, in his experiment, had set out to detect the absolute motion of the Earth. Had he succeeded, he would have proved that there is a difference between motion and rest a difference that can be detected in an experiment. The truth is that either way, success or failure, the results of Michelson's experiment would have faced physics with a grave dilemma. As it turned out, the dilemma was almost beyond imagining, even to the imagination of Hendrik Lorentz. Of course, we can imagine Lorenz, if we choose, as a pitcher for the Brooklyn Dodgers. Suppose he had been capable of launching a fastball at six-tenths the speed of light, while rolling past Albert at the same speed. Surely, fast as Henry's pitch had been, it would seem much faster to Albert. But, and here's what the Michelson-Morley experiment said. If both Albert and Henry watched the same light beam, each would think it was traveling at the speed of light relative to himself, even though they were moving relative to each other. Such mind-boggling consequences were hard to accept, even for a mind such as that of Hendrik Lorentz. He worked out a mathematical theory that accounted for the experiment, but it was based on the mysterious, unverified properties of a newly discovered particle called the electron. It took a younger man, a fresh point of view, to see the speed of light in an entirely new light. His name was Albert Einstein, and in physics, his was the way of the future. But no one had done more to illuminate that future than Albert Michelson himself. For nearly 50 years after his first interferometer, he lived on, measuring the speed of light with ever-increasing precision. Measuring the diameter of a star for the first time ever, and even admitting, finally, that his interferometer experiment had provided the verification of Albert Einstein's theory of relativity. The V's was the measurement of the velocity of light. The second, the measurement of the diameter of a star. And the third, 
was a test of the Einstein theory of relativity. I also want to respect the scientific community, the friendship of Albert Einstein, and became the first American to win the Nobel Prize. But to the end of his days, he never fully accepted the implications of his famous experiment. It must be admitted, he confessed in 1931, these experiments are not sufficient to justify the hypothesis of an ether. But then, he wondered, how can the negative results be explained? On the surface, like unintentional shadows on a canvas, there are dark areas in the life of Albert Abraham Michelson. For despite all the bright spots in a career of 50 years, he tended to focus on his so-called failure of 1887. Since the result of the original experiment was negative, he concluded, the problem is still demanding a solution. But in reality, Michelson's experiment, if it was a failure, was the most brilliant failure in all the history of science. And the solution he sought, but refused to accept, Albert Einstein's theory of relativity, would change forever the very meaning of space and time. We often teach physics in a historical way. The purpose, of course, is not to teach history, but to teach physics. And so very often we redesign the history. We tell you not what really happened, but what should have happened. Well, I suppose that it serves some pedagogical purpose to do that. So let me tell you what should have happened at this point. There should have been a patent clerk in Switzerland named Albert Einstein, who should have said, look, the michelson morley experiment compels us to do two things. One is to restore the principle of relativity. And the other one is to believe that the speed of light will be the same to all observers, regardless of their state of motion. And from those two fundamental postulates follow all the astonishing results of the theory of relativity. Now let me tell you what the facts were. One is that Michelson, of course, never for the rest of his life believed the results of his own experiment. But the other one is that Einstein not only didn't base his theory on the michelson morley experiment, but he later claimed that when he wrote his famous paper in 1905, he had never even heard of the michelson morley experiment. Now we'll see how that was possible when we go on with this next time. Okay. Okay, so that's a really nice story, okay? And uh, if you can revisit this, this video again some other time, you know, you might be able to extract more information from it. I'm putting that here, uh, mechanical universe, mechanical universe, the Mike Mike so Morley experiment, Morley experiment, and that's a very important video to review before we start to talk about the real, special theory of relativity of Einstein. Okay, Mike so Morley experiment okay i'll leave that right thing here for you in the notes and uh, any questions about that okay so that's uh you know sometimes things like that that uh, explained in this video happens to, to a scientist in his life okay during his career not just for scientists but to an engineer and uh, you know maybe in the future, when you start to exercise your profession, right, you're going to face something, a dilemma like that that Mike Stone Morley faced. And uh, when, when you face this type of dilemma, just remember this video. Yeah, I see you in 15 minutes. Thank you.
Okay, I'm back here. And I found this nice video here in the YouTube. And it is about uh, what we are covering, about waves, about diffraction. It's like 15 minutes long. It's really nice from what I have watching here. And I hope you like it too. Let's, let's watch it for like 17 minutes and I will place its link here in our notes. Video about waves and diffraction. It's amazing the quality of videos that we have. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Seven years ago, kind of an old video. But... And also have that idea of phasers, right? Here, you know, diffraction interference patterns with phasor diagrams. So if you should even understand how the phasor diagram works, you're going to have a, a better visualiz visualization of it now, OK? When a wave passes through a wall with two holes, a striped interference pattern is created. But an interference pattern can also be created even if the wave passes through a wall with just a single hole. Okay, so that's the phenomenon of diffraction that we're going to start covering very soon, okay? And when we made the derivations for the two slit interference pattern, we didn't took into account this type of wave phenomenon that happens through a single hole. So if you have a single hole, you're still going to form a, an interference pattern. And this type of interference pattern, we call a diffraction. So when we made those derivations for the Schwitzlitt experiment of uh, Thomas Young, we didn't take that into consideration. This is a more difficult problem, by the way. Uh, how to treat it mathematically is a more difficult problem. And that's what we are going to do in the next step, okay? But let's watch this video. Note see that you do not have to have a second uh, slit here to create an interference pattern. Just a single slit, that is enough to create an interference pattern. And uh, we even have some pictures in your book. Right in here. If you take a look at your book, here's a picture of... Uh, this blade, right? All those lights that you see here kind of distorted, right? Those are all results of diffraction patterns. And diffraction pattern doesn't happen only whenever you look through a hole, but it also happens at the edges of uh, certain objects. OK. To understand why this is the case, 
We need to understand that each wave can be thought of as the combination of an infinite number of smaller waves that spread out in all directions. When the wave hits a barrier with a small hole, only the portion of the wave that is directly behind the hole is able to pass through. This is why waves spread out when they pass through a barrier with a small hole. If the hole is bigger, then more waves are able to pass through and these waves have the ability to interfere with each other. To understand the interference pattern that these waves will produce, let us first consider the interference pattern created by two small holes. Okay, what you see here is the Yang's experiment, right? And with two slits. The waves coming out of each of the holes can be thought of as sine waves that travel out in all directions. The waves, as seen along a one-dimensional line, can be thought of as just a single sine wave. At any given point, the interference pattern formed by the two waves from the holes can be thought of as the sum of the two sine waves along the intersecting lines coming from the two holes. When the peaks of two sine waves occur at the same time, we say that the two waves are in phase. Since both sine waves are created by the same original wave, which passes through both holes at the same time, the two sine waves are always in phase at the moment when they exit the holes. The two sine waves are also in phase for any point for which the distances from the two poles are equal. The distances from the two poles will no longer be equal if the angle of this yellow line changes. The more the angle of this yellow line changes, the greater the difference in distances from the two holes. The greater the difference in the distances from the two holes, the greater the difference in the phases of the two sine waves.
All right, that's the phasor diagram, okay? Here, the, she's representing the X and Y and the T along the vertical direction. That's what uh, she's representing. The sum of two sine waves with the same frequency and phase can be represented graphically like this. The sum of two sine waves with the same frequency but different phases can be represented graphically like this. Therefore, the sum of two sine waves of the same frequency is always another sine wave of the exact same frequency, but with a different amplitude and phase. The amplitude of the sum is represented by the length of this green line. In the case of the sine waves coming from our two small holes, the two waves have the same amplitude and frequency, but different phases. As the angle of this yellow line changes, the difference in phases increases. As the difference between the phases increases, the sum of the two sine waves also changes. The amplitude of the sum of the two sine waves is represented by the length of this green line. In some cases, their sum has a very large amplitude, and in other cases, their sum has an amplitude of zero. As the angle of the yellow line changes, the sum of the two sine waves increases and decreases, as is shown by the length of the green line. This is why a striped pattern is produced.
Now, instead of two small holes, let us consider the case of just a single large hole. The single large hole can be thought of as a number of small holes that are right next to each other. A sine wave comes out of each of these holes and these sine waves add together. As before, as the angle of this yellow line changes, the differences in the phases of the sine waves increases. As the differences in the phases of the sine waves increases, this can be represented as shown. Here, as the difference in phases increases, the amplitude of the sum of all the sine waves goes up and down as before, and this again creates a striped pattern. This time, however, each peak in the sum of the sine waves is smaller than the one before it. means that the amplitude of the wave becomes much smaller as the angle of this yellow line increases. Now let's consider another scenario where the hole is even bigger. In this case, this can be thought of as an even larger number of small holes next to each other. As before, each of these holes generates a sine wave and all these sine waves add together. As the angle of this yellow line changes, the differences in the phases of the sine waves increases. As the differences in the phases of the sine waves increases, their sum can be represented as shown. This time, as the phase between each of the sine waves changes by even a very small amount, the amplitude of the sum of all the sine waves goes down very rapidly. This means that with a larger hole, if the angle of this yellow line changes, the amplitude of the wave decreases very rapidly. 
For this reason, when a wave passes through a large hole, the amplitude of the wave is strong only directly in front of the hole. The wave spreads out only when the hole is small relative to the size of the wavelength. If the hole is long relative to the size of the wavelength, the wave does not spread out and instead looks like it is traveling in a straight line. Much more information is available in the video titled Waves, Light, Sound, and the Nature of Reality, and in the other videos on this channel. Please subscribe for notifications when new videos are ready. Okay, I'm gonna put my... Pretty good, uh, I like that. There are more, right? Let's see what's going on here. Okay, those are another video of the same series, right? So let's start that. And interference patterns, okay? We can do all sorts of arts with, uh, with waves. I have a software that I used to work a lot on it to, to, to get different patterns, interesting patterns of the waves. And uh, what I want to do now, now that you must have a, a good idea, right? What, what uh, diffraction is all about. I'm going to work here with the mathematical treatment of the diffraction pattern. Here. here you go. That's uh, okay. We did the true slit, right? Here, the, the treatment of the true slit. Let's see. And what was missing in the true slit uh, treatment was the effect of the size of the slit. Actually, in reality, when you have one slit here, you don't have just a single wave propagating from the slit, but multiple waves propagating from the slit. And that's what produced that uh, this pattern that you see right in here with a decreasing intensity of the bright spots, right? And that's what the theoretical prediction was. When I cramped up the formulas, that was exactly what the theoretical prediction was compared again to the real life. That's real life, theoretical prediction, right? Real life, theoretical prediction. And again, the theoretical prediction of that previous model that I showed to you shows something like that because it doesn't take into account the diffraction that occurs when a wave propagates through a slit, through an ap ap aperture. And before we get into the actual diffraction, let's let's. Uh, here you go, here you go. We have a, that's the diffraction. Once a single slit, right? I have a screen. We have a wave going through that aperture. And we do find that that interference pattern is formed on the screen at the, at the right. And how do we treat, how can we possibly treat this type of situation? Okay, we should consider that once the wave goes through this slit, we have 
multiple sources that uh, multiple point sources that are formed here within this slit, producing a wave that's going to interfere with itself, just like she described in the video, right? So here you go. So here you go. In order to treat this situation, what we do? We start with only three waves. That was this, the simplest uh, way, okay? And then all those sources equidistant in the in the hole. Okay, before before we do, don't forget this problem here that you saw is much more difficult than the other problems. So let's uh, let's see, you know, let's try to solve a simpler problem first, and let's see if we can somehow extend it to the case of multiple sources in there. Okay, but a word of caution. Okay, this is just. Uh, a type of phenomenological model that doesn't explain everything, but at least prepares you for the next step. Okay, so just like in the case of the two slits, we have here the situation in which the distance to the screen is much larger than the aperture of the, the size of the aperture of the hole size of the aperture, right? And since we have those three light rays that are being projected at this, that screen, just like in the case of the true speed experiment, those light rays are almost parallel to one another. Okay, and we can form that right angle triangle that we saw before, okay? And once we do for three, we do for five, so we do for five. We repeat this, you know, this procedure for five and many other sources in there. So let's do that. That's the idea behind that. And uh, I'm going to start with three. So what we have to do, we have to look at the phase difference between one and two and three and two. Okay. The phase difference between one and two and three and two is going to be the following. He notes. Ah, I don't know. R2 minus R1 is going to be given by, going back to the drawing, R1 and R2, right? So here you go, we have this right angle triangle would be more like that, right? Here you go. That looks like better. So R2 minus R1 is this distance that approximately this distance that you see right in here. Okay. This distance is here is A divided by two is the size of the aperture, A divided by two. This angle, theta one, theta two, and theta three, they are almost the same. The right angle triangle is this one, and then, you know, we have uh, this theta angle approximately here. So this difference here is gonna be approximately A over two times sine of theta. Right? A 
over two sine of theta. Then we repeat that for R3 minus R2. R3 minus R2, we go for this one here. This distance is almost the same as this one. So what's left is this difference right in here. Okay. And just like before, it's going to be also a over two sine of theta. R3 minus R2. But by the way, it's not an equality, it is an approximation. Approximation, approximation. Okay. And now we go for the next step. The next step is that for destructive interference, interference, we must have the following condition. And that should be half of a wavelength, right? Or 180 degrees phase difference. So we take this equality. This approximation, right? And we get, we develop it to the next step. We cancel the half. So we take something like that. That's for three light sources. That for three light sources fitting within that aperture. Okay. What about five? Like uh, sources, we see in the aperture. Okay, here's three, right? Here is n. You can say n. I'm going to do. I'm going to add one more drawing here. Here you go. I'm going to put this one right like that. And the next one is this one. Good. Now I'm going to go for five for the just like in the other case. You're going to have a right angle triangle. Let's say this one is R1, R2, R3, R4, R5. Next is going to be something like that, right? and so on. And so what do we get? We're going to do just uh, points, source points that are next to each other. R2 minus R1, that's R1, that's R2, oops, this one here, that's R1, that's R2, we get this little something here that's R2 minus R1, and this angle is almost theta, All right, let me zoom in a little bit more. 
this angle here is almost theta. So what is left here is going to be this distance, which by the way, is gonna be A divided by four, okay? One, two is five sources, but we, one, two, three, four, right? But the distance is one quarter of A. One quarter, two quarters, three quarters, four quarters. But that is five sources, right? And we can have A divided by four sine of theta. A divided by four sine of theta and so on, right? Four minus three and then five minus four. Five minus four. And just like before, we must have, if you have this, you know, destructive interference, all those relations must be equal to lambda over two. And then you get two lambda here for this case. Then you repeat it. Then you repeat for seven sources. When we repeat for seven sources, you get something like that. Okay. And look at the pattern here. A sine of theta one lambda, A sine of theta two lambda, A sine of theta three lambda, right? And so on. Repeating for a large number, of sources, we get this expression here, m lambda, m equal to one, two, three, right? m equal to one, one, two, three, And that is the condition that is the condition for dark spots in a interference pattern, in an interference pattern. But a word of caution, but a word of caution This technique that I used here works only for dark fringes. If you repeat, okay, in other words, in other words, if you repeat it for bright spots, you will get an incorrect result. Okay, and why is that? And why is that? Well, the reason is because uh, it's because uh, this is not a rigorous technique, but it's still useful. But it's still useful to find the. Uh, the dark fringes in a in an interference pattern, okay? Inter, in a not interference, in a diffraction pattern. So, what would be a best the best way to do that? There's a better way to do that, okay? Let's go just take a look here at the book. And that's the book right in here. Okay, diffraction by a single slit, locating the minimum, the minimum, right? So he did exactly what I did, one, two, three, right? 
Here, you got the right angle triangle, a sine of theta equal to lambda, first minimum. And then you do one, two, three, four, five, just like I did as well. Okay, and you repeat that, a sine of theta equal to two lambda, second minimum, and so on. A sine of theta, m lambda. Okay. So let's do this example. So here you go, I split up with A is illuminated by white light. For what value of A will the first minimum for red light of wavelengths 650 appear at theta equal to 15 degrees, right? So we go. First minimum. Okay. So you want 15 degrees. He's asking the value of A. Let's take a look. Let's go look here at our solution. Um, <clears throat> wavelength 650, 50. Uh, for what value of A will the first minimum? Oops. Find A, right? Diffraction, the problem, the diffraction pattern with a slit of size A. Okay. What is A? What is A? What is A for a wavelengths? of 650 nanometers if the first dark fringe appears at theta equal to 15 degrees, right? So what you gotta do here, solution, right? You have to use this formula. Since it's the first dark fringe, M must be equal to one, right? And lambda, we have lambda and you go, one, 650, sine of 15. That would be the size of the slit. And you get 2.5 microns. So if you're going to have a condition like this one, you must have a slit of this size to satisfy this condition here. Okay, and then he's asking another question here. What's the wavelength lambda prime of the light whose first side diffraction minimum is at 15 degrees, thus coinciding with the first minimum for the red light? Okay. Side diffraction minimum is a... That's coinciding with the first minimum of the red light. Hmm. Think about that. And, and let's see what we need to go. So if we have, uh, oh, we have, what the lambda time? Huh? First side diffraction maximum. Ah, maximum. He's not asking minimum, right? He's asking maximum. Is that 15 degrees? Okay. We can locate the first minimum, right? We are going to have that bright spot on the on the middle. That would would be the the 
let's say m equal to zero, and then you're going to have that fringe, dark fringe next to this bright spot, and then you're going to have the next, uh, the next uh, bright spot. So the pattern is going to be looking like that. Uh, We saw that before, right? Let me zoom out and here you go. This it will be something like that. Okay, you're going to have this bright spot right in here. You located the first minimum. And then what he's asking, he's asking you know, what would be the wavelength in which the first maximum of that wavelength lambda prime will coincide with the minimum of lambda of the, of the red spot. Okay, that's what he's asking. And we are going to see here, go back to my, yeah. So the situation goes like that, you know? The dark spot for wavelengths lambda prime is going to be a different theta right now, right there, okay? And let's not forget for both cases we have m equal to one, but he's asking and that will be 15 degrees. And no, that's not, that's not gonna be 15 degrees, sorry. It's gonna be theta prime, it's gonna be theta prime. Okay. Let's calculate this theta prime for lambda prime. And it's gonna be lambda prime over A. Okay, and uh, theta prime is gonna be something like that. Arc of sine, arc of sine, okay? Okay, but that, don't forget, that's the dark spot. Dark spot of the other wavelengths. That's the dark spot of the other wavelengths. Okay. It's a maximum, right? So now I want the bright spot of that, of that wavelength to be 15 degrees as well, okay? Those first and second minimum. So the first I call I located the first minimum. Okay. And now I have to locate the second minimum. Why is that? Going back to the drawing again. Here you go. Here's the first minimum. Here's the second minimum. And that's the first bright spot that we have for that other wavelengths. Okay. So let's do that. Let's uh, do the calculation there as well. The, uh, now let's see, I'm gonna put dark comma one, right? Dark comma one. And uh, dark comma two. is going to be twice, right? Twice the wavelengths, because we have an M lambda there. So the bright spot is gonna be somewhere between those two angles. Okay, so that's what he did here. And what did, did what else did he do here? He took uh, the average, right? He took the average two, uh, one between one and two. He got the average of one point five. That's what we, where the 
the bright spot would be. Okay, so here you go. Let's see. We can. So the bright spot. Uh, the bright spot. First bright spot. I'm going to put here parentheses. Sign. Uh, I'll, I'll take advantage of this one here. Oh, oh. oh, one. That would be 1.5. For you to understand better, it's better to you write that in terms of the sign, right? The prime here means what? The prime means the other wavelengths. Dark. Two, we, we go, this one, this one like that. So he took the average of those two, 1.5. And now we do know that this bright spot coincides with the dark spot of the green, of the red light. So we put like 15 degrees here. The A, we already have what the A value, right? What the A value is. Let's take a look there. 2.5 microns. Okay. A value here is 2.5 microns. And we can solve for the wavelengths that we want. Like that. And let's do the math. What time is that? 10.30? Let's uh, Two point five divided by one point five, and now we gotta multiply by the sine radians of fifteen. Let's see if we get it. I'm getting four hundred and thirty nanometers. Let's see if that what he got. Yeah, four hundred and thirty nanometers. Okay, so he. That approximately. Maybe 431. 431 nanometers. 431 nanometers is what? Is the blue light, right? Let's take a look. Wavelengths range of blue. Wavelengths range of blue light. Oops. Blue two, no, that's blue two, no. <laughs> Wavelengths range of blue light. 380 to 400. 431 is, is fall within that. That's the example that we have. And, and now what we're going to do, we're going to do this section here. Let's see what, how our break, when's our next break, right? That's uh, 9.35. Okay, so you have almost one hour. Okay, that's time for us.
for our next break. And any questions about that? So what's very important to note is that, you know, this is more like a phenomenological type of derivation. It's not a rigorous one, okay? But it is still useful, but only to find the position of the dark fringes. If you repeat this type of procedure for the bright spot, you're not going to get any. You're not going to get it the right. You're not going to get the right uh, result. Okay. So be aware of that. In order to really get the correct result, is is going to be what we are going to do next. You know, which is to calculate the intensity in a single slit diffraction case. We are going to use. We're going to use phasor diagrams to figure just like uh, you have here. We're going to use phasor diagrams. And then we are going to, it's a, it's a real, little bit lengthy procedure, OK? But we are going to get the correct uh, result, OK? So let's take a break now. Any questions about that? Okay, so let's go for a break, 10, 10.35 to 10.50 a.m. So I see you shortly. Raymond asked the question, right? I just saw it now. Sorry, not answering earlier. Raymond, so Raymond was asking, it's an approximation because of the angle. It, it is an approximation because this line here is almost parallel to this line, okay? And consequently, this line also is almost parallel to this third line and so on, okay? And that, that's what the approximation that I'm using. And then, what else? Okay, the approximation comes right in here. The approximation comes right in here. Because this line is almost parallel to this other one here, we can come up with this other line that's going to create a right angle triangle, okay? Right angle triangle. Now, strictly speaking, this distance from here to here is different from this distance from here to here, strictly speaking, okay? But because those two lines are almost parallel to each other, we can say that what you see right here, right? It's, what you're going to see right here is going to be a right angle triangle. And also what's going to be right in here is going to be the difference between this and this one. That's that, that's where the approximation lies, okay, Raymond? Strictly speaking, you know, this length here is not one minus the other. No, strictly speaking, it's not, okay? But uh, because this length here, the distance L is much greater than A, we can come up with this approximation. And we, we, we are doing this approximation over and over again, right? I, I, in case that you you know see that, right? So, just, just to emphasize, let's see if I can do that. Okay, I'm going to exaggerate now. Let's see here, let's see. I wanna make sure I can do that. Okay. Yeah, here you go. Now I'm going to put it together group. Okay. Can I do that? No, it looks like I didn't group it right. Let's see. One and two. Did I get it? Let's see. Group. Huh. Strange. Why is it doing that? Really strange. But let's see if I can get it. Okay. Uh, no, no, it's not doing what I want. Let, let me see if I can do it in a different uh, slide, okay? I'm gonna copy 
this one with one group. I'm gonna get this one and this one. Okay. And let me get this one as well. And those two. Let's see if I can do the simulation that I I want to do. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to put the source right in here. Uh, hopefully, you know, I don't need that. All right. I don't need that either. And then I'm going to do that. Let's, let's see if it's going to work the way I'm thinking it should work. Group. Ah, interesting. Yeah, that uh, now it's not working the way I want it, unfortunately. But uh, I'm going to ungroup it and group, right? I'm going to be very, here you go. I'm going to exaggerate this case, okay? Think about, suppose that L were comparable to, to A, right? That should be A. Suppose that L were to be comparable to A, right? And we'd, you'd get something like that. Obviously, this one here is longer than this one, right? And the right angle triangle is in reality. In this case, the right angle triangle is in reality here. Okay, and of, of course, this one is longer than this one. If this one is D1 and D2, right? And this one should be A over two. Then you can calculate uh, what would be the difference between D1 and D2, just from this right angle triangle, okay? But then what, what are we doing? What is the approximation that we are doing? The approximation that we are doing is this one right in here. Okay, the approximation that they're doing is the following. We are saying that this length is equal to this length. That's what we are saying. But we can say that this length is equal to this length, provided, you know, the distance from this spot to the extreme right is very large compared to this distance. Obviously, you can see right here that this distance here is not going to be equal to this one. This one in this case is going to be greater, right? But if we make those lines much longer, you know, we are going to say that this length here will be approximately equal to this length. Okay? But you can see it. From this, even from this illustration, you can see that we have a right angle triangle, right? And if we have a right angle triangle in which this one is a side and this one is the hypotenuse, obviously this side is going to be longer than this one. But again, what is the approximation that we're making? The approximation that we're making is that this length is going to be equal to this length here because this distance is very long, okay? That's where the approximation lies. How do we know what constant to use for m? Okay, it's given by the problem. Okay, the constant, the, uh, the, what's going to be the constant of the value for m is going to be depending on what the problem is asking. So, in the case of this problem that we do, this example that we did, right, what he asked, he asked, what was the First dark position of our of our diffraction pattern is asking the distance from the central maximum. The, he asked, uh, let's say, he asked the wavelengths, right? Uh, let, let's go back to the problem. I you know. Okay. Uh, Okay, so what he's asking is the following. Suppose 
that this dark, this first dark, right? Gonna look at the the problem, right? For a bit, uh, a little bit, a is illuminated by white light. For what value of a will the first minimum, first minimum for red light of wavelength signal appear at the theta fifteen degrees, right? Okay, so the first minimum is this one right here, and he's telling us, look, theta is fifteen degrees. Okay, this from here to here is gonna be 15 degrees. That's the angle. And what's going to be the value for A for the first minimum to be 15 degrees, okay? So, in this specific case, M is gonna be equal to one, not, not zero, okay? But it's gonna be equal to one. Don't do, I don't have the, the diffraction pattern here with me, okay? This is something else. This is the double slit experiment, but that should be m equal to one. So that's where you get uh, the values for m. Okay. Mm -hmm. And in the next one, what's the wavelength of lambda prime of the light whose first side diffraction maximum is at 15 degrees? Okay. The first side diffraction maximum occurs between the dark. Uh, pattern m equal to one and m equal to two, okay? That's what he's saying here. So it's gonna be anywhere between those dark, the dark patterns, the, the dark fringes, the dark fringes. But is that given by the problem? How do we know what constant if they want us to find the bright spot? Uh -huh. How do we know it's not? Oh yeah, that's right. How do we know it's, it's not one point? That's right, that's true. Well, they are making an approximation here, okay? They, they are assuming that uh, the, the, oh, the, because the, the dark spots are evenly spaced, okay? is a reasonable assumption that the bright spot is going to be at, uh, right in the middle between the dark, okay? In reality, we do not know, yeah. In reality, we do not know because we, we didn't derive the formula for the bright spot, but this is just a, a reasonable assumption. That's why he used M equal to 1.5. First, it can be located ah, approximately, okay? Approximately. By setting M equal to, equal to 1.5. So it's not an exact solution, but it's still, you know, a good approximation. And a reasonable assumption as well. And it's projected to be at the same end. Yeah, that, that's right. So what he's saying is the following, right? So he go, his note C, note C that he said, we are passing white light. See that? We are passing white light. That's what he's saying, right? So if this one is, oh, but let's go back to my, if this one here is the position of the dark fringes for red light, Right? If this one is the position of the fringes for red light. So let's say the other one that we got was, the other wavelength that we got was, let's see, was blue, right? 460. 430 was blue, right? So the fringes for the blue light is gonna be somewhat like the following, right? Uh, the blue light is gonna be a little, must be a little bit smaller, okay, to make it same. Uh, I'm gonna to try to, let me, let me copy this one first, so you can have side by side, and then you can have a better idea what he's asking in the problem. Here you go, I'm gonna bring it down. So let's say this one is the diffraction pattern for the red light for the first uh, wavelength, right? Let's say this one is there. And then what is he saying? He's saying that now we have a different wavelength, which is blue. I'm going to put this one as being blue. OK. And I'm gonna put it very close to this one. Let's say that's the bright, bright spot. Oops. What he's saying is that uh, 
the first side bright spot oh, of the blue wavelength of the other wavelengths is falling exactly here at this spot corresponding to the first dark fringe. That's what he's saying. Okay. It's projected to be at the same angle as the dark spot of the red light, right? Dark spot of the red light, dark spot of the red light, dark spot of the red light, right? And then dark spot of the blue light, dark spot of the blue light. So the first side maximum would be between m equal to one and m equal to two, which would coincide with this dark spot of the red light. That's what he's saying. Okay, and then you can go ahead and fill it up for the others. Those trees would be like that, okay? Of course, the intensity is going to decrease, right? But I don't uh, I didn't do that. Right spot. Okay, so let's go and and what I want to do, I want to it's not it's not the interference pattern of the opus lead experiment, but this one is gonna be diffraction pattern, okay, diffraction pattern of a single slit, single slit. In the case of the diffraction pattern of single slit. This first dark region is going to be m equal to one, two, three, and so on. It has a different, and here it's going to be minus one, minus two, minus three. That would be right. Okay. And don't, I'm going to remove this zero. You're going to have a bright spot, yes, in the diffraction pattern, but that's the illustration that you have to keep in mind. One, two, three. Minus one, minus two, and minus three. Like that. That's the picture that you must have uh, when you're solving that example. I don't need the dark spot here. I don't need this bright spot, right? How oh, any dark? Uh, okay, I need that. And this one would go elsewhere. It goes around here, okay? Okay, now we can move the next. Let's see, we did this one. Okay, now we should start with the derivation of the intensity. Of the diffraction pattern. Okay, so okay, this is approximate technique. Okay, the above is an approximate uh, technique. Not not an approximate. I don't even call it an approximation technique. I would say quite. This is quite a quite a good guess. The above is quite a good guess, right? for finding the position of the dark fringes of a diffraction pattern. I don't even call it an approximation. I call it as just plain lucky that uh, a simple technique like this one allowed us to find the position of the dark spot of the dark fringes, okay? It's quite a good guess. Quite a good, lucky guess for finding the position of the dark springs of a diffraction pattern. 
so much that if we were to repeat this procedure for the condition of a constructive interference, interference, comma, we would not get a, we would get, let's see, let's not do a negative, right? We would get an incorrect result. So consider ourselves lucky. So consider ourselves lucky. Consider ourselves lucky. <laughs> if we really want to know if we, we really want to have a, a better model of a diffraction pattern, we must use uh, the phaser technique. And that's what we are going to do right now. It's very, it's rather lengthy, but, uh, but it gives us the proper results. And we were going to just, you know, here you go. We have, uh, going, going back here. Going back to the diffraction pattern. We have, let's say one, two, three, four, five, right? One, two, three, four, five sources. What we're going to do here is the following. We are going to consider that those sources are made up of electric fields, right? And they're going to write down the electric field wave of this source, this source, this source, this source, and so on. Not just five, but N sources. And there is a really neat way of calculating that using, using the phasor technique, the phasor diagram. Okay. So recall that, uh, recall that. For the two slit, two slits case, okay, we considered one electric field, one electric field coming from each slit and made them interfere at a at this screen, right? So basically what we did uh, for the derivation of the two slit experiment, we got the electric field of one of the slits and sum up with the electric field of the second slit. So, so you know, for the two slit model, we did the following. E equal to E1 plus E2. That's what we did. Not only we did that, we, we did that mathematically, but we also, we also, right? We also derived the, the resulting field using the phasor diagram. And we got the same result, whether using the phasor diagram or the sine and cosine techniques, right? The trigonometric function. And then, and then we square, and then we square the resulting field to obtain the intensity. And that's the important thing to have in mind, right? The human eye doesn't detect an interference between electric fields. The human eye doesn't have this capability. The capability of the human eye and many detectors out there is that they have the cap capability of detecting the square of the resulting fields, okay? 
The human eye and other detectors doesn't have the capability of getting just the electric field itself, right? But has the capability of detecting the square of the resulting electric field. That's called the intensity, which, by the way, is proportional to the intensity. Okay, so what we're going to do for the, for the, what we're going to do for this diffraction pattern is that we are going to adapt the phasor diagram technique, diagram technique. that we used previously, that's what we're going to do. And the way we do it is, the, is in the following way. We do it in the following way. One, we consider our first electric field coming from this lit as being, you know, E naught sine A X minus Vt. And then we consider that not only we have this first electric field, but we also have this next second electric field that's going to have a similar relation with the same uh, amplitude, but it's gonna have a different phase that I'm gonna call pi of two with respect to one, okay? And then we're going to have a third electric field, right? With a phase of three with respect to two. And a fourth electric field that has another phase for with respect to three, and so on until you know we get to the end electric field. And going to infinity, of course, right? Having a phase different that's given, then I'm going to label like that. And then in the next step, in the next step, in the next step, we sum all these fields, okay? We sum all the fields uh -huh, for x equal at position zero. Just like we did for the twizzlet case. Okay. Oh. Not only at for x equal to zero, but also for t equal to zero. So you don't have that uh, time variation, right? If we do that, we are going to get uh, an electric field. The first electric field is gonna be zero. You replace zero here, zero here, right? You get zero here. We place zero here, zero here. And then we get the phase difference. We place, right? And don't forget, I'm going to emphasize that is electric field at x equal to zero and at instant of time equal to zero as well. For every one of those fields coming from the it's lit, diffraction, on the diffraction aperture, like that.
So the problem reduces to sum all those cubes. You can do that with sine of cosine, but you are better off doing that with a phasor diagram, okay? And the way we do it like that. The first field has no phase at all. First field has no phase at all, right? And uh, it has even have an amplitude equal to zero. I mentioned to you, right? Have an amplitude equal to zero. And uh, amplitude equal to zero in the phase or diagram can be represented as, let's see, uh, this vector here. Here's the zero electric field in the phase or diagram. You do have an amplitude, but the projection of this amplitude along the y-axis is zero, okay? That's my first field, E1. My second field, E2, yeah, is going to have the same amplitude, E0, but it will have a projection on the y-axis that's gonna be given by the sine of the phase angle of the second field with res the phasing of the second field with respect to the first field and so on, right? Here you go, here's the other one for three, two. Uh, actually, this one is should, that's not the right angle, right? The right, right angle is gonna be shown in the next uh, diagram. Uh, the right angle, let me show that for you right now. It has to be written down in terms of the, oh, yeah, I got it. It's like that. That is phi 1, 2, yes, but uh, it's not. What you see as phi 3, 2 is not phi 3, 2, okay? Phi 3, 2 is this angle here. Is with respect to the second field, okay? It's like that. put everything uh, into a diagram, it's going to be like that. Here's E1 lined along the x-axis. Here's E2 making an angle phi to 1 with respect to the first field. E3 making an angle phi 3 to with respect to E2 and so on. Okay? Now look what's happening here. When I sum only four of those fields, I get this net electric field. Okay? Which is, of course, going to be rotating here in this xy plane. Every, everything here is, ro is rotating in, along the xy plane. Okay? And I'm even going to write down the net field. So for completeness, right? For the sake of completeness, the E total E total. At x equal to zero, t equal to zero is summation. Okay, of uh, I from one to N of E sub I. And that's the type of summation that we have to determine, right? Which can be here written as E naught Sine phi i comma i minus i minus one like that, and I'm even going to do like that, you know, to make it more 
Yeah, it's gonna be like that. It's gonna do like that because my E1 is gonna be zero, remember? I can take the E naught out of the summation. Okay. Okay, for evenly spaced, you know, for evenly spaced light sources along uh, the slit, along the aperture, okay? Is the following, is the following, right? Uh, for evenly spaced light sources, let's say for five, right? Five evenly spaced light sources along the aperture, we have the following. We have the following. We did that before, remember? We did that before. Let's get that there. Right in here. Right? If we, and, and remember, we also did for three, right? Let's take a look for the, for three, Here you go. That's for three. This one for three evenly spaced like sources along the aperture, we have the following, right? We see here, we have three light sources and we have two here. We have five light sources, we have four here. We can repeat for seven, okay? It's possible to repeat for seven. But we're not going to do that because it's too much work, okay? But uh, if we repeat uh, the above for n evenly spaced point sources, we have, I guess you already figured out by yourself, right? We have the following. I, genetic, right? I minus one. I minus one. We have N light sources. So what you're gonna have here, you're gonna have N minus one. Okay? And let's not forget, this is an approximation. Okay. And we can, we're going to do another approximation for n, for very large values, very large values of n. Okay. The above becomes Just a second approximation here. One is much smaller, right? And much greater than one, and they are both become something like that. Okay. Because, okay, so. The pass, don't forget, this is the pass length difference, right? The pass length difference between uh, light sources evenly spaced is the same. No matter what the pair you get, right? But there's more to that. There's more. There is a call. Recall that uh, that there is 
a relation between the pass length difference and the phase difference. Remember that? We're going to need that. We're going to need that because my electric fields here are written down in terms of the phase difference. So we have to change our pass lengths. We have to write our pass lengths in terms of the phase difference. Okay? So, and how do we find out, how do we relate one with the other? Well, it's a very simple rule of three. Okay, so here you go. The way it goes is like that, lambda, the wavelengths has, you know, the path, path length of a single wavelength is equal to a phase difference equal to 2 pi, 180 degrees, right? Consequently, a path length, path length phase difference, a path length difference of Ri minus, Ri minus one, Oh, I gotta put this one right in here. Is going to oh no. This one here is going to be given by that phase angle of hours that uh, we will finally be able to relate to something that we know. That's how it goes. And let's go for the next step. I want to solve for the phase difference. If I go to the other side, lambda goes downstairs. The path length difference here goes upstairs to the other side. Like that. And then there is an approximation here that we can use as well. That we found, that's the approximation. Don't forget this n is not the index of a fraction. This n is the is a very large integer number. Okay. And what does it tell us? It tells us that this equation tells us Remember, this angle is approximately the same, right? And uh, by the way, that should be an approximation here. Let's not keep track, not, let's not lose track of that, right? This is an approximation. This one is not an approximation, but from here to here, yeah, it is an approximation because we are replacing what is not an approximation with what is an approximation, right? So, Theta here is going to be the same because the lines are almost parallel to each other. So what this equation is telling us, this equation is telling us the following. This equation is telling us that pi 2 minus pi 1 is equal to pi 3 minus 5, 2, which is equal to 5, 4 minus 5, 3, right? And so on. 1, 2, 3, equal 5, and minus Phi n minus one, which is equal to, okay, which is not equal, but it's approximately equal to this value here. N is a finite number. Theta is almost the same. Wavelengths is the same for everybody. Okay, A doesn't change. Okay, so now we are going to find, we are going to find 
the angle that E sub N makes with the X axis. Okay, E sub N, the last phasor, right? The last electric field phasor. And how do we do that? Okay. Oh, this angle, I'll call it phi. And let's not forget, uh, let me show you here the, okay. The angle that I'm talking about, suppose that's the last uh, electric field, okay? The angle I'm talking about is this one here, okay? That's the angle I'm talking about. And by the way, this angle that you see right in here is going to be what? It's going to be the sum of all those angles that you see here, okay? So here you go. This angle that you see here is going to be phi to one plus phi to three plus phi for three, and so on. We need that. We need this information to get to get it going. So this angle I'll call this angle I call the phi angle. Or here you go. Phi equal. Let's get my summation. My summation sign right in here. Uh, I'll get this one. Whoop. Right. And what we get, what I'm going to get here is going to be something like that. Right? It should be phi two, right? I from two, two to n. And what else do we do? We have an expression for this guy here, which is going to, by the way, is going to be an approximation. Keeping track of our approximations, right? Like that. And what we end up having here is the following. Uh, let's put like two one from one there. It has to be one here. And this term is going to go right in here. 2 pi, oh, they are all constants, right? They're all constants. It doesn't depend on, none of those depend on i. And look what we're going to get. OK, we are going to get the number one here inside the summation. Okay, and by the way, this number one can be rewritten in a different way. This number one can be rewritten in terms of this parameter i raised to the zero power. And when we do that, now we'll figure out how we can rewrite my, my summation. No, that's going to be all that stuff here that you see, you know. One to the zero power plus two to the zero power plus three to the zero power. Make sense? One, two, three plus n to the zero power. What seems to be, you know, hopeless. Now it's time to starting to be not that hopeless at all. Because we're dealing with multiple electric field summation, 
right? And we still have an approximation here. We got to deal with this guy. Here is one, two, three, right? What we have here is going to be N. Then. And look what we get. This N cancel out with this N. Look oh, how beautiful it is. And we find that the final angle of the final electric field is finite, has this value here. Okay? That's what we find. So looking back. So well, let's summarize here. Summarize so far. Summarize. It's almost, man, it's past our break, right? Each electric field has the same magnitude. Magnitude. Two, the angle between each adjacent field, their phase angle, is the same. Surprising, right? And now, there is something that behaves just like that. There is a geometric figure that behaves just like that. Okay. A polygon behaves just like that. Okay. Not just a polygon, a section of a polygon behaves just like that. If you have just three electric fields, we are going to have, you know, a sec a, a poly a section of a polygon with three sides. It's going to be something like the following. Okay, so here we go. It's going to be something like the following. This is a section of a polygon. Because it's a section of the, the, those sides are exactly the same and their angles, the angle difference are the same. Because their sides are the same and their angle difference are the same, this polygon must have a center. Here would be the center of our polygon. And look here at the total electric field, the net phasor electric field. We start to, to find out what is the how does the net electric field is going to look like, OK? But let's not forget that we're not going to have two or three or four electric fields. We're going to have n electric fields. We have to have a, where n is a bunch, is a large number of electric fields. So what is what we thought being a polygon is, in reality, is a polygon with a very large number of Sides. A polygon is a very large number of sides, you know, is a section of a circle. Okay. Remember, it's an electric field with n components, and all those electric fields have the same magnitude, the same amplitude. So little by little, I start to have a picture of uh, what we are looking for. Here's the section of my circle. Here is the center of my circle. Okay, a section of my circle. In a circle is nothing but a polygon. A polygon of size, uh, infinite, uh, infinite sides, and length equal to zero, going to zero. And now we can start uh, solving this problem, right? Having a better idea how to solve this problem. Here's the radius of the circle. Here's the radius of the circle. Here's the net electric field, the summation E1 plus EN, right? Here is the radius of the circle and here's the angle X. Here is the angle to X, right? What else? 
What else can we picture here? Let's calculate uh, Okay, now see that we have my angle phi here that we found. We found already what this angle phi is all about, right? It's tangent to the final electric field. We are going to use this angle phi here for our, for our next step. And what is our next step? Okay, our next step is the following, you know, the radius times this angle phi is going to be n times e naught. Do you see that? Okay, the phi. Okay, there is a neat relation hidden here in this drawing. Let's see if we can find it, okay? Here you go. Pi over two, right? Where's the pi over two? This is pi over two here, right? Plus x plus y is equal to pi, right? pi over 2 plus x, and let's call that y equal to pi. Let's write it down. Let's see what else we have. And then my y here, right, it's uh, going to be It's going to be what? My Y. Okay. My Y. You know, it's going to be pi over 2 minus 5 over 2. Okay. So let's see. Here you go. Here, here is Y. Ah, it's a little bit ugly, right? It's a little bit ugly, but that uh, that's okay. This is phi. This pi. This is pi minus phi. Okay. Pi minus phi. Okay. And then that divided by two plus pi over two plus x is going to be pi. Okay. So let's. Uh, let me write, write that down here. I'll find. So here go. I'm going to write. Uh, let me put it aside. Let's see here. Yeah, let's uh, write it here. Gonna be like that, you know. X plus Y, right? Plus we had that other one there. Uh, yeah, I like this one better. X plus Y plus pi over two, right? That's easy to see. Pi over two is equal to. Not this one. This one here is equal to pi. 180 degrees is equal to pi. But wait a minute. My y is going to be given by pi over 2 minus pi over 2. Okay. And we can solve for x. This term here, you know, sum with those two. That's just geometry now. 
but it's not any problem with geometry, though that's a kind of diff difficult problem with geometry. This pi cancel out with this other pi, right? And that x angle that you saw is going to be equal to phi over two. It's gonna be like that. Going back to my, so we found uh, that this angle, this half angle here is phi over two. Consequently, this angle here must be phi. If this angle here is phi, I can here write r phi equal to the to this length here. But this length here is gonna be n times e naught. N times the magnitude of the electric field. Okay, so let me write that down. So now we found our radius. That's very lengthy derivation. That's in your book, by the way, but it's not in as much uh, detail as I'm making here. It's gonna be N E naught, okay? And the radius, I found the radius of that section of the circle. Uh, what time is that? Wow, 11.49 already, okay? Uh. Okay, and what else do we have? Well, we have the next step here is, you know, Mitoto, okay. Now going back to my to my drawing. See here, we have this right angle triangle, right? So that's half e total. E total over two divided by r should be equal to sine of phi over two, right? So. E total over two divided by R, right? Should be equal to the sine of phi over two. We want to find the total, remember that? We've just found what? R is, we are almost over. Very lengthy derivation. And now we substitute my R right in here. Right in here, here you go. Don't forget that these two can be the, can be can divide the phi downstairs. Now we have phi over two here and phi over two here. Okay. And so we are almost over. Here is the net electric field. Recall that we detect. Recall that our eyes detect the intensity or the square of the electric field, okay? We don't need to, to worry about this end, by the way, okay? So what we are going to get is that the intensity is going to be proportional to the square of the electric field, right? To the square of this guy here. You go. And we can even neglect the N here. Okay. 
because all we're looking for is for the relationship between intensity and the phase angle. And we finally have, you know, I'm going to write that down in terms of IMAX, okay? That we still do not know IMAX, here you go. And this one here is going to be over downstairs. This one's going to be here. IMAX doesn't have the square value, but the sine of phi over two have the square value. Okay, that, and then it becomes an equality. Hey, but wait a minute. We already know what phi over two is, right? Let's take a look. Phi, 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 phi. Man, so many things, right? Where is the phi? Looks like I overshoot it here. Phi, phi, okay, phi, right here. That's phi. I don't have phi over two, but I have phi, which uh, is not a problem. Now I can place right in here. Oops. What the heck is going on? Oh, it's not copying it. Oh, what a what a disappointment. Oh, I don't know why he's doing that. Let's see. Okay. <laughs> this one didn't did complain. Love it. Okay. And now I can. Okay, the two cancels out, and finally we have this result. Two cancels out is two. Two cancels out is two. Okay. If you are going to plot something like that, okay, let me show the plots. We get something like that. A peak here and little, you know, peaks sideways, okay? Against the angle of a single slit, okay? Due to diffraction effects, plot of the intensity against the angle. And uh, that, uh, okay, that's for plot intensity against the angle of single slit to diffraction. Ratio between slit size and wavelength, 1.5, okay? The ratio here is five. The slit size much is greater than the wavelengths. So you get a sharper and sharper peak. Here, because the size of this list is comparable to that, the wavelengths, you don't get a sharp peak. You get a broader peak, peak okay? And that's what exactly what we, and what else do we have to do here? Uh, so for the young double slit experiment, we get, we're supposed to get something of this nature, okay? We have that cosine square that we got before, but then, you also have that modulation factor of the slit, of the side of the slit that we put there. And now we got uh, we got it right. Let's see, 1157 right now. Oh, the phi over two where is coming from? Why are we switching i equal to one? Let's see here. Uh, how do we know? Okay, is it why are we switching between i equal to one and i equal to two for the summations? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I, I believe I went back, right? Uh, let's see. I know what you're talking about, Raymond. Let's see here. Yeah. Um, oh, yes, must be from one to n, right? I, I, I didn't switch to two. I, I went back to, to, to one. I went back to one, okay? I guess that answered your question, right? And where's the phi over two coming from? Okay, let's see where the phi over two comes from. This phi over two comes from here. Is here's the phi over two as as we, why is phi over two equal to x? Uh, let's see here. Okay, here is phi over two x. Okay, that's x, right? X, y, and pi over two equal to pi, right? That you that you understand, right? Okay, 
So let's go to the next one. And then you got to look at this triangle here. Okay, you got to look at this triangle here. Uh, this one is going to be wide, right? And once you, you get uh, this one, pi over two and phi over two. Yeah, there is, there is, let's see, there, there is a, this is a, like I said, this is a geometry problem, right? And uh, that's, hmm. let's see if I remember. Well, let's, let's take a little break here first, and then I'll come up with your, your answer when, when I, when I get back, okay? I bet there are lots of people hungry right now. Okay, and uh, we get back uh, after the, the, the lunch break, half an hour from now. Any more questions? Okay, I see you in 30 minutes. It's 12 noon right now, and then we are going to do the, the lab uh, to experiment. Yes, it is going to be break, break from 12 noon to 12.30. Okay, so let's finalize that. So, uh, Raymond was asking a very relevant question, okay? So let's take a look at the, uh, the, the answer to our question, Raymond, is in that drawing, okay? It's, and like I said, everything is, has to do with a geometry problem. So, you know, we recognize that this angle here is phi, right? That's, there's no doubt about that, right? Let me put that here. Okay, is Raymond there? <laughs> yeah, okay, good. That's uh, pi minus phi. There's no doubt about that, right? Because we have pi here, we recognize this one is phi. Consequently, this one has to be pi minus phi. And look carefully at this triangle here. Okay, look carefully at this triangle here. Here, this line must be tangent to this circle right in here. And this line must be tangent at the circle there. Consequently, this angle here is going to be 90 degrees. And this angle here must also be 90 degrees, right? It should be a little bit more. It's not in the proper, it's not in the proper scale, okay? This guy is supposed to be, you know, inclined to, towards there, okay? So now, if this one is 90 degrees, this one is 90 minus y. This one here is 90 minus y. And this one too must be 90 minus y. Right? So here you go. Pi minus five with this one, which is this one here. Pi over two minus y. Pi over two minus y equal to y, oh, equal to 180 degrees. So it's hidden in there. Those, this pi over two and this pi over two cancel out with this pi, right? We are left with minus 2y, and then we got what? The, and then we have the solution for, for what you asked, right? Pi over 2, let's see, yeah, minus pi over 2. That's where it comes from. Okay. So we have this triangle here, right? that has two unknowns, x and y, x and y, and then we have this triangle here. So we use those two triangles to find x and y. Yeah. Yeah, it's not, it's not an easy, you know, it's a geometry problem, but it's not an easy one, right? There are lots of things hidden in there that we have to extract and uh, to, to, to get, uh, 
to get everything to match. And, and then, you know, even, even one more important detail, right? That uh, we, I, want, I would like to point out, you know, note C that N is a very large number, right? Here you go. And, and E naught is a very small angle, right? A very small value, right? As the number of sides of our polygon increases, the size of my polynomial of my the side the side of the sides of the polygon 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 decreases. So because this one is increasing while at the same time this is decreasing, it means that this multiplication here must be a finite number. Okay? Must be a finite number. So the idea would be to put an N here and recognize that N times E naught is a finite number. N times E naught, N times E naught, you know, must be, must be a finite number because when one, when N uh, increases, E naught, decreases okay so our final result doesn't uh, doesn't blow up right and let me see if i yeah those are the details that no book uh, provides you even you know the the best the best book i have seen that uh, derived this Relation was your book, okay? But even even this book here, he misses in many of the details that you have to figure out on your own. He did, he did a pretty decent job compared to other books, but it's still not ideal, okay? And many of the details that I discussed here is this was not here in the book. Okay. Oh, yeah. Here you see that. And let's see, that's, uh, okay, so we did uh, 36, right? Let's go here. 36, that's diffraction. Single is lead diffraction, intense in single lead is lead diffraction. Then we are going to do the rest. Diffraction by a double, it's lead diffraction gratings, okay? Dispersion and resolving power. And, uh, you know, we have four more to do. I'm not going to cover this one. So let's go for our lab, right? And I want to take attendance because this is a lab. Lab attendance. Today is the 27th. Tuesday. And I me, are you there? Okay, thank you. Alisa, are you there? Oh, if, I'm uh, here. Okay, thank you, Alisa. Are we recording? We are recording, right? Yeah, we are recording. Good. Ashley, are you there? I'm here. Thank you. Next is Sartak. Hello, Sartak. Okay, I'm gonna put a star here on Sartak. His name is listed, but it's not answering. Mary. I don't see Mary in my list. Raymond, Raymond's definitely here. Hello, I'm here. Okay, thank you. Basilio Lopez. Present. Thank you. Jeshwan Moham. I'm here. Thank you, Zaid. Thank you, Zaid. Kartika? I don't see Kartika here. Sydney? I'm here, Professor. Thank you. Sumana? Oh, Sartak, okay. I'm here. Sumana, Sumana here? Okay, good. Thank you. 
fact that you just answered it right. Next is Kirakus. Thank you. Next is Andy. And he's coming on board. Okay. Karthika. Andy, are you there? Okay. Alex Hernandez. Hello, Alex. Okay, gonna put a star here. Alexis Madrigal. Here. Thank you. And we have a total of 13, 14. Let's see how many we have here. Okay, must, there must be one more student that I, Kartika. Are you there? Yeah. Yes. Okay. That's Kartika. Okay, thank you. And Alex Hernandez, give you another opportunity here, Alex. Okay, it's not answering. So, good. So, okay, the groups are set up. Everybody has a group, right? And let's do the other. Lab number two now is. Okay, let's make sure everything is fine here. The script that you're gonna follow is gonna be very similar. The only difference is gonna be the procedure, the experiment and the procedure, okay? But uh, let's see, that sounds right, nothing here. Professor, I wanted to ask you a quick question. Sorry to interrupt. Sure. Um, for the the lab report, did you want us to put? Did you care about how? Do you have a preference of how we ordered the tables and the the graphs and all that? In the, uh, let's see the 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 spreadsheet. You should not change the spreadsheet at all. You leave yes. it in format. Do not add any any columns. Do not add any rows. Okay. So leave it in this order because uh, the disorder matters when, when I corrected the lab report. In the hard copy, in the Word document, then you do according to that, uh, to that order, right? That, uh, that I mentioned, you have to have those two tables here first, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, those, the remaining of the table should be at the end. And don't forget the graphs, of course. Okay, right? so like the first, the first two tables and then followed by the graphs, followed by those last tables, correct? Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, just checking. Sometimes, sometimes it's gonna be just uh, one table, right? Uh, maybe, but I guess most of the time it's gonna be those two tables here. Okay, okay. thank you, Professor. Okay. okay, seems all right here. More. Yeah. I'm going to upload those spreadsheets to your group folder. And oops, not not what I want. Drive. We go. Google Drive. Mm. Personal info. Oh. Uh, I guess I'm in the wrong place here. Let's search. Drive. 
Oh my, ask for Google Drive. Okay, let's go on. Thousand twenty three, thirty nine group folder, and now I will upload laptop. Group one, group two. Group three, group four, group five. And that's what we have. Go ahead, start downloading your spreadsheet. Second Lab Excel. Okay, Second Lab Excel is now in your group folder. Okay, Raymond? to Alex Hernandez. Good. Good. And Okay, and mm -hmm. I'm looking here for my notes and very soon I'll be with you, okay? So, okay, um, good, I got it, you got it, something else here. Lab two, physical panel. I'm gonna copy and paste. Okay, so, okay, what you need to do, right? Go to your group folder and download the data for today's lab. Lab do, do not, number two, do not change the spreadsheet title. Okay, today's experiment is the physical pendulum. And what we have here for this experiment, I'm going to, here you go, here's the list of equipment, right? The ruler and a meter stick. Just uh, what you have here is the resolution of your ruler and your meter stick, right? It goes all the way down to one millimeter, three decimal places in the meter, in the meter scale. The timer, just like for this simple pendulum, we had to know what was the resolution of the timer and the 
meter stick. In addition to the timer, we also have a scale to measure the mass of our physical pendulum. The scale that we use that at LA Harbor is goes to a hundredth of a gram, which ends up being five decimal places in the kilogram, in the kilogram unit. The metal bar is the physical pendulum. This metal bar has a bunch of holes in there. We have a support rod for the metal bar, table clamp and rod clamp. Let's take a look at the drawing of the physical pendulum. It's not here. It's in the other one. Let me get the thirty-nine relativity illustration. Um, harmonic motion must be this one. Yeah, that's the simple pendulum. Okay, that's how the physical pendulum looks like. It's a metal bar with a bunch of holes. One, two, three, right? And then you have this fulcrum in the in this rod support. And this fulcrum is inserted into one of these holes of the metal bar. Okay, the metal bar has a length L. Let's take a look at the spreadsheet. data, no, not this one, 1023, lab and raw data. I'm gonna look at the last lab. Okay, so here you go. We measure the lengths of the Metal bar, we're gonna need that. This one is 1.12 meters. The center of mass is gonna be right here in the middle, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Yeah, right of the middle of the metal bar. We also need the mass of the metal bar. So we did measure the mass with the scale. Don't forget to put it in the proper significant digits, right? 1,300, oh, 1, 1. kilogram, according to this data. Oh, let's not forget this one is red. Go ahead and correct that for me. Two measurements, okay, two measurements. And I want to go through the theory that we did before. OK, so how do we model this type of device, right? Well, it's just the Newton's law, Newton's second law of motion for a rigid body. Net torque is equal to the moment of inertia times acceleration, angular acceleration. And then we have to figure out what the, what the net torque is. The net torque is going to be due to the normal of the fulcrum and the weight of the pendulum. Okay, good. So here's the center of mass. Okay, here's the weight and here's the normal. We have to take the torque with respect to the point of rotation. The torque of the normal with respect to the point of rotation is going to be zero. Significant figures, sure. Let's go back to the significant. 
Don't forget is the resolution, right? Right in here. You're talking about the notes, right, Alisa? Right in here. Okay, so the ruler, you know, has a resolution of one millimeter, right? The meter stick is one millimeter as well. The timer is one hundred of a of a second. The scale is the new one that uh, I'm sharing with you. It's one hundred of a gram, so you end up with five five decimal places, not necessarily significant figures, right? So those are the measurements that we're going to make. Ruler, meter stick, timer, and scale. Let's continue here. Here you go. The torque of the normal is zero, so the only thing that's left is the torque of the wave. The torque of the wave is this component that you see right in here, and this angle is theta. Theta should be here as well, but should be sine of theta, right? This component is exactly this component, so it's going to be mg sine of theta. mg d sine of theta, and one more detail, one important detail. The angle is measured in this direction, right? Uh, and uh, the torque is against the increase of the angle. Consequently, it should be negative. The torque should be negative, and that's why I put a negative value here. The moment of inertia should be the moment of inertia with respect to that point O, the point of rotation. And we have this differential equation that we solved before. Mg, the oh, D, what's D? D is the distance of the center of mass to the point of rotation. Do we have D in our equation? In our equation or in our spreadsheet? Yes, we have D here. We're gonna change D, right? And see what happens. It's similar, it's analogous to changing the length of the simple pendulum. What we're doing here is analogous to that. And we are going to count uh, three oscillations only, okay? Now, wait a minute, no, it's not three oscillations. We're going to count 10 oscillations. It's three different measurements, okay? So here you go. Raw data, right? Raw data, raw data, raw data, raw data, raw data. Everything else is calculation, is results. Everything else are results. But let's continue with our derivation. Okay, we're MGD over I naught, sine of theta, we do the approximation for the small angles that the theta, that's where the theta goes. And we can have the solution cosine of omega t. Okay, I naught, we have to find out what I naught is, right? Omega square, the angular frequency, right? MGD over I naught. Uh, let's see. Let's see, where, where's I naught here? Oh, I naught, here you go. I naught is I of the center of mass. That's the parallel axis theorem that we learned in physics 37, right? Plus MD square, mass of the uh, of the physical pendulum, right? Times D square. The I of the center of mass is an approximation, right? Because that uh, rod has several holes in there. So what I'm getting here is in reality an approximation. That's a good approximation. And that's what we get for the moment of inertia. We can get the period of the pendulum by doing this relation here. Okay. And that's what I get for the period, period of the pendulum.
And what do you want to do? Let's see. Yeah. Here's the equation. What we want to do, we want to plot t average against this square root here, where we have the d dependence. I'm going to highlight the d so you know what we're doing. We're varying d, right? L and g are constants. If I want to have a linear dependence in terms of t, for, for t, we have to get this square root here in one of the one of the columns of the spreadsheet. And oh, that's what I have here. Okay. T average is this the sum of those divided by three. Don't forget to get the proper significant figures of the T average, right? This one is a very is a very complicated relation. Consequently, you don't need the, the significant figures there. And finally, we have the T average. That's going to be the lower T average divided by 10. That's the period of the pendulum. The period of the pendulum for different, different uh, Ds, different Ds, okay? So what you have to do, you have to plot T versus that. That's your first step. That's the first thing you do. And fit a linear curve. Okay, plot T average in the, along the y-axis and that square root along the x-axis. Fit a linear regression equation to the graph. Plot the slope in the left table. Look at the percentage difference. Work on the units. Work on the sig fix. Determine the CL. Okay. This is an ex this is an experiment that works very well. Let's see. Am I missing anything here? Any questions about that? So let's do that. First thing, yeah, right? First thing first, the graphs. There is only one graph here. I'm going to plot my graph, insert, chart, this one. Hmm. Yeah, it's not a very good graph what I'm getting here. But anyway, I got it. Okay, so I'm going to get the trend line. And I get, I'm getting this, this slope. Let's take a look at what zero four nine eight seven. Last table uh, is local right in here. It's supposed to be point six one. You can see that I didn't. Those students didn't get a good uh, a good data pool. No, 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 not all at once. It didn't copy my zero four nine eight seven. Uh, it doesn't copy it. Okay, 0 0.4987. 0 .4987. Yeah, we got we're getting 23% difference here. I could see right from the bat. It looks like the incorrect points are those ones here. Okay, that all looks like because those points are moving with a higher slope, right? So let's see if it, those are the right ones or not. Oh. In order to find out what is the bad data, you know, we can deselect what do I believe to be the bad data from the good data, okay? So I believe that the bad data is those one, two, three, four points. One, two, three, four. The ones the highest, oh, wait a minute, values. Four, six, eight, seven. Did I put four, nine there? Oh, I'm getting 4987. I put 46. Okay, good point. Here you go. Oh, now it's 18%. It's too high. It's too high, right? Where's the lab? Thank you, Alisa. 
And where is the lab? What what do you mean? Where is the lab? Is it in the group folder? You get the you get the spreadsheet. Let's see. Let's see if everybody has the group one. Uh, yeah, group one has. Group two. Group two has. Okay. Group three. Yeah. Group three also has it. Group four. Yeah. Then the, the, your group folder, right? Uh, uh, Alexis. Did you get it, Alexis? Okay, good. Thanks. Okay, so now I'm going to find out if those points are the bad ones or not. I believe they are. So how do we do that? You know, Excel allows you to do that. You just eliminate what you believe to be the bad data point and see what you get. Those four data points on the top seems to be the bad data. Uh-oh, something wrong here. Uh, let's see. OK, now we got it. Now, now I have a different slope, right? A higher slope, which, by the way, is closer to 0.61, right? So it looks like the students, when they performed this experiment, they, they made some sort of mistake that ended up affecting all those four points, OK? What type of mistake they made, I do not know, right? Because I was not there to, I was there, right? I was there to see what they were doing. But uh... OK, now we are getting a better percentage difference. See that? Hopefully, none of you are going to have this problem. Let me undo. Do everything. Good. And cutting off and that's the part you all want to do right now. Let's go through the every student here and that our fourth meeting. First thing that I want to ask you if you got the spreadsheet. I mean, did you get the spreadsheet? Um, yeah, my group did. Okay, thank you. Alisa, you got the spreadsheet? Yeah, we're working on it right now. Okay. Ashley? Yeah, we got the spreadsheet. Okay, good. Tartak? Okay, what's the, what's the question? Yeah. Oops. Go ahead, ask the question. Do you have to remove a data point to get us close to the... No, no, don't remove. Don't remove. You use all the data points, okay? Why? Did you get a... You didn't get a good, uh, a good data there? Oh, okay. So you don't have to worry about that, right? Ah, oh, seven percent is great. Yeah. Okay. I, just, just me. I had to do that because I was getting like twenty percent, right? But that's a technique that you folks can use for other experimental data that you, you know, that you collect. They teach that in medical school as well. Sometimes, for some reason, you know, equipment fails or the experimenter who is performing the experiment was distracted and made a mistake, okay? Some of, sometimes, sometimes we don't know the source of the error of the data, okay? Sometimes we do not know. And I would say most of the time, right? Because if you make a mistake and you know that you made a mistake, you'd, you'd have repeated the measurement, right? Uh, would the unit be Let's let's check. Let's check what the unit of that. Uh, Got to do dimensional analysis, right? Okay. Whatever is. Oh, let's let's go to the to the formula. That's better. Okay, the formula is better. The easier to see. Okay, you can see that this guy here has no unit whatsoever because it's a regular number. It's a regular mathematical number. 
And what you see here is meter squared divided by meter squared. So there is no unit here upstairs. How? Oh, and there's no unit downstairs either, right? Okay. So D, right? Cancel out uh, the unit of D cancels out with the unit of L. So do we have a mass there? No, we don't have a mass there, right? Yeah, there's no mass here. D is the distance of the center of mass to the point of rotation, okay? So D and L are both in meters. So now you tell me what the unit is. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, it's not, a, it's, it's not a, a mass, right? If you don't have any unit, like is the, that's the case, right? You just put the number one here. You do that for all labs that I have, the unitless. What you see there is a unitless parameter. Okay. And where was it? Okay, Mary. Hi, Mary. Are you there? Okay, so let me give you attendance here. Did you download their spreadsheet? Yes, okay. Next. Raymond, you downloaded your spreadsheet, right, Raymond? Okay, next is Basilio. Yes, I was able to download it. Okay, good. Jeshua? Yeah, I have downloaded it. Good. Said? Good. Any questions so far? Kartika? Where is Kartika? Okay, there the top. I cannot hear you, Kartika. Your mic is on, but I don't uh, I don't hear you. You might want to type there in the in the chat window. Okay, so I, I'm not hearing anything from Kartika. Okay, I'm gonna just put a little star here. And Sydney? Yes, I downloaded it. Okay, good. Next is Sumana. Where's Sumana? Sumana's not here. Okay, I'm gonna put a star next to Sumana's name. Kirakos, are you there? Okay, do you download the spreadsheet? Okay, good. Any questions? Okay, good. Andy, Andy, he. Okay, next is Alex Hernandez. You can find the link. Okay. So you mean to the Google Drive? Your group number five. I'll get that for you. Yeah, for the drive. Okay, make sure you store it in a safe place and don't share don't share this link with anyone other than your group members, okay? So working on that, Alexis Madrigal. Uh, no, sorry, I, I still don't have access to it. I thought I did, but it's a different lab. Can, I, I still need access to it or the link. Okay, you don't, you don't have the link? Not yet. Okay, so let's see. Ale uh, that's Alexis, right? Alexis. Here you go. So can our group turn the lab into the Google Drive? That's how you do it. Yeah, that's how you do it. 
You want you want to upload it now? Did you finish already, Raymond? Everything? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. Go ahead. Up, uh, uh, upload there. Yeah. Upload there and. Uh, let's see. Yeah, we. The first lab report is due the day after tomorrow, right? Lab one. Lab two is going to be due. Oh, oh, no, Monday. Let's do that on Monday. Lab one. Due June 29. Lab two report, right? Do. Lab one report, do lab two report, do on. Wow, we're already in July here. And we have a 4th of July on Tuesday. Huh. July 3rd. Lab two report to the end. I will. Put that on the syllabus fraction. Lab to do. Lab to do. Yeah. What time is that? One fifteen. Okay, let's go in our on our break. We see, we just started. Yeah, twelve thirty, right? Let's go another fifteen minutes before the break. How are you doing there? And we have, uh, let's see, here go, 4th of July, right? On a Tuesday. Huh? Did I put Monday? Oh, strange. Yeah, weekday, let's see. 12th of June, okay. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. 29, that's correct. Ha, huh. interesting. Monday, Tuesday, okay. Wednesday and Thursday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. That's good. The next plot the graph. Let's see if you have plotted the graph. Okay, graph. Okay, I mean, did you plot the graph? Um, yes, I could plotted it. Okay, have any questions? Um, we had a question on the CL values. Okay. And tell me what's that? 
Yeah, um, what the, we got point zero 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 one zero for the minimum, and then for the maximum, it's just one. Does that sound correct? Yeah, okay, let's see, you're group number one, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's plot that together, here you go. This is the graph you want to plot, insert, chart, here you go. Oh, you are, you are, your data is, did you get a data, did you get a graph like that? Yeah. Okay, so it looks like you got the same data that I got. It looks like, so I'm going to add trend line, linear, Okay, you said you got R square. Which value did you get for R square? Um, the same one as yours. Ah, okay, good. Yeah. Okay, so you have this R square, and you have how many data points? You have eight data points, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's get the the table, CL table, and let's see. Eight data points belongs right in here. Right? And let's see what's the R squared again. My R is square is 9658, 0.9658, right? 9658 is somewhere between those two values. Okay? Mm -hmm. So 9658, yeah. So your CL is going to be between this value and this value. That will be the lower bound. That will be the upper bound. Don't forget, it's 1 minus 10 to minus 4, 1 minus 10 to minus 5. Oh, OK, I see. That helps a lot. Okay. What, what, what was that that you got? I didn't quite understand what you got. You got 0. 0.00. Oh, um, we had an incorrect um maximum value but we're oh. able to fix it yeah okay so yeah. when when you enter there in your spreadsheet don't forget right it's 10 to minus 4 1 minus 10 to minus 4 1 minus 10 to minus 5 okay so you're gonna you're gonna do like that equal 1 minus 10 to minus 4 right equal 1 minus 10 to minus 5 that's how you're gonna do it Okay. Oh, okay. Make sure you put an equal there on the on the side of the numbers so Excel mm -hmm. can do the calculation. Okay, so let's go for I'm gonna skip to group number two. Mary, did you get the graph plotted? Yeah, okay, good. Any questions? No, okay. So let's go to group number three, Zaid. Did you plot the graph? I have, okay. Okay, any questions? Do you have any questions? No, okay, good. What about Kartika? Hello, Kartika. Yeah, Karsika must be away from the computer. And next is Sydney. Did you plot the graph? Yes, we, we have it graphed. Okay, good. Any questions about that? No, I think I'm good. Okay. What about Sumana? I don't see Sumana here. Okay, and 15, 14, okay. Looks like three students are away. Okay. Next is going to be 
Okay, Alex, uh, did you manage to download the spreadsheet? Alex Hernandez. Hello, Alex, are you there? Okay, so let's go for Alexis. I'm gonna put a star here. Are you there, Alexis? Alexis Madrigal. Uh, yes, I'm here. Did you manage to download the spreadsheet? Uh, yeah, but I, I, th I think you gave me access to the wrong one because the one you really? gave me, huh. uh. Uh, it has uh like the graphs already. It it has all this stuff already. Wait a minute. Let me see. Uh, group number five, right? Yeah. Uh. Okay. Do we see group number five here at the top? Yeah. Okay. So let's see. Where is the graph? I don't see any graph here. Let me. Oh no! Then I'm the the link you put in the Zoom chat. It it, it gave me it, it gave me access to a, a different. Um, really? Let me check. Yeah. Let me check which group that is. Oh, group five. It's still group five. See that? Now let's see. Group folder. I presume that's correct. Physics 39, see that? 2023, no, it's your group folder. Is that how it looks like in your in your browser? Oh, uh, never mind, never mind. It's uh, our group, one of our group mates uh, plotted it. I, I had no clue. Okay, maybe, yeah. uh, let's see, let me download it here. five yeah there's no graphs here do it maybe you downloaded the lab one let's see if it's that lab one Okay, uh, let's see when the hard copy. Okay, everything is due on Monday, okay, for this lab number two. Both the spreadsheet and the Word document. Let's see about that or right. maybe that's why. Okay. Huh. Yes, someone put the, oh, that's lab number one. The, the, the spreadsheet that has a graph in there is lab number one, okay? Not lab number two. Now, okay, so that's fair to say that you're working on that. Okay, 127 right now. Okay, Alex Hernandez. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's let's go for our break and then uh lab one report to you know spreadsheet and word document spreadsheet and word document. Like that. Yeah. 
am going to go for a break. Q 1.45 p.m., right? Also, I have downloaded Excel sheet for attendance. What do I mean? You download the Excel sheet for attendance column in. Column in. Uh, I thought there was a star. Okay. Well, uh, that was uh, a previous lab. That was not this lab. Okay. Number two it was the second lab. Yeah. Yeah, that was a previous lab. You should, uh, yeah, you should concentrate on this one. That's the fourth meeting, right? And, okay, so I see you, 145. Okay, we're back here. So, how are you doing there? So, let's see, 15 more minutes to go, right? Any, do we have any difficulties here with this lab? Rather straightforward, right? Alisa, did you plot the graphs? Is Alisa there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, did you plot the graph? Yeah, I think we're done with everything. Okay. Oh, you're done? Okay, that's good. So let's see. I'm gonna write it down. Done. Your whole group must be done or just you? Um, I think we're all done. We just have to like make the hard copy. Okay. The word documents, right? Okay, good. So let's see. Sartak. Did you get the graph, Sartak? Yeah. Oh, you're done? Okay, that's good. I'm gonna put that here. Done. Let's see. Anybody else? R Raymond must be done, right? Yeah, Raymond is done. What about Basilio? Do you get the graph? Do you uh, the graph? I do have the graph, Professor. Okay. And what about the rest? Are you still working on the rest or remaining? Yes, I'm still working on the rest. Okay, working. Not good. Let's see. Let's go to Kartika. Are you there, Kartika? Sorry, Professor. I had to step out for a second, but I just got back. Okay. The, did you plot the graph? I did plot the graph, though, yes. Okay, good. What are you doing now? Um, I, I'm, I just finished plotting the graph. Ah, okay, good. So the next one should be to fill in the tables, right? When look at the percentage difference. And let's see. Sumana, are you there, Sumana? Yeah, I'm working on the graph. On the graph? Okay. Let's put that here. And Kirakos? Hello, Kirakos. Are you there? Okay, I'm going to put the star here. Andy? Okay, do you plot the graph? Okay, okay, good. And work on the rest, right? What about Alex? Did you manage to plot the graph, Alex? Alex Hernandez, right? Okay, I can hear from, okay, I'm gonna put star here on Alex. What about Alexis? 
Did you plot the graph, Alexis? Uh, yes, I did. Okay. What about the rest? Did you manage to find uh, it? No, not yet. Okay, good. So I'm gonna put working here. Twelve more minutes to go, and going back here to the notes. Okay, log the slope in the last table, working on the units, work on the six figures, determine the CL. Okay. Yeah, if you're done, you can leave. Yeah, that's right. Unless you have any questions and you need some help. I have office hours, so if you want to hang around and ask me any questions, I'll be around. And Not this one. Ooh. Oh. Getting some cold here. Yeah, I need, yes, need any help? Yeah, I had a question on the hard copy lab report. Yeah. Um. So the title page is just should the is there a specific like format you want it to be in like should everything be like centered in the middle of the page or yeah let's see well let me get the title page that i got last time right there's nothing you know special about that and lab reports lab one right let's take a look at lab one this one Okay, so yeah, lab report, center justified, right? Physics mm -hmm. 39, lab one, and then you write down the title of the experiment, and then the student's name in order of uh, family name. Okay, you don't need to put student one, two, and three. Group number, and the date that we did that for this, for lab number two, it's going to be the 27th. Okay, and then okay. the rest, you just, you know, place the table there, copy and, and paste the tables here. And make sure you work out the format. It looks nice, right? Mm -hmm. Nice and clean. Um, do you want us to, so for the next page, when it talks about tables and graphs, do you want us to, like, put labels under them or to like clarify what it actually is representing? No, just, just copy and paste the tables there. Oh, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Any more questions? Let's see how we're doing here. Uh, so it's all the, what the hard, yeah, that's right. Just copy and paste the tables and graphs. That's right. Uh -huh. But work a nice, uh, a, a nice document. Okay, don't just copy and paste and leave uh, whatever way you pasted in there. You might need to to do some uh, adjustments, right, in the table that you have there. Okay, so <clears throat> yeah, that goes. Yeah, you two have a good, have a great week, have a great day, right? Kirakus, are you there? Oh yeah. Okay. Did you plot the graph? 
Ah, okay, good. Any questions? Okay, good. I will 